Professor Savagnin. Yes. Hello there. Yes. How are you doing, sir? Well, it's 320. Can't be all bad. <laughs> all right. Whew. God almighty. Yeah. What well, what a what a rigmarole what a what a uh, uh, odyssey to try to get this all uh straightened when out. When we are when we are on air, you can dispense with the God Almighty. You can call me Sam. <laughs> all right. Yeah, this will be edited out. All right. Uh let's get right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Obsidian Radio, the live stream show. And uh my very special guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is the world renowned expert on narcissism. Uh, Dr. Sam Vaknin, his reputation truly precedes him. Best-selling author of the book uh, *Malignant Narcissism*. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, *Malignant Self-Love: Narcissism Revisited*. Currently in its tenth edition, and um, I got wind of Dr. Vaknin via a relatively dated now uh, documentary on the BBC that I saw, and that really intrigued me because a number of my own personal life experiences dealing with what would be considered narcissists in black America really intrigued me. So that's what got me to studying up a little bit on it from a layman's perspective. And I said, what the heck, let me reach out, reach out to Dr. Vaknin and see if he'd be willing to talk to us. He's very gracious and uh, coming on to spend a little time to talk to yours truly and the audience. Uh, Dr. Vaknin, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's kind of you. All right. Uh, let's just get right into it. Um, because this is a primarily black audience and it's been in my humble opinion that uh, we don't, for whatever reason, and I wanted to plumb the depths of that a little bit with you, we don't talk about these things, you know, mental health and psychology and stuff like that. For whatever reason, we just don't do that. So if you could, could you explain to the audience what narcissism is and then we can go into your particular take on it and what have you? Well, narcissism has two manifestations. One is healthy and one is pathological. Healthy narcissism starts very early in childhood, in the first few months of life. And later on, it constitutes the foundation of self-esteem, self-confidence, and a well-regulated sense of self-worth. The sense of self-worth includes the realization of one's own limitations on the one hand and one's advantages, skills, and talents on the other. So a balanced view of oneself. The thing is that in, in the case of pathological narcissism, these are people who cannot regulate their sense of self-esteem by themselves. They can't do it. So what, what they do instead, they reach out to other people and they ask other people to give them feedback which will help them to regulate their sense of identity and their sense of uh, self-esteem and self-confidence. So they ask people, what do you think about me? Do you think I'm a genius? Do you think I'm perfect? Do you think I'm brilliant? Do you think I'm omniscient, all-knowing? Do you think I'm omnipotent, all-powerful? And they expect people to tell them exactly this. This process is called narcissistic supply. It is hunting for attention, uh, cajoling, and convincing and coercing, if needed, people to provide you with this regulatory function, which usually is carried on from the inside. Now, because, because this is the exact equivalent of a drug addiction, an addiction to a substance, um, the narcissist is addicted to this attention. Without this attention, the narcissist feels vitiated, feels annulled, feels dead. Hmm. So, so this constitutes an addiction. So, so narcissists are actually junkies. And they behave exactly as junkies do. They lack empathy. They're very exploitative. They are a bit, you know, antisocial, not to say criminalized. They are, um, they regard as other people as mere functions or objects. They are one track minded in, a, in the single pursuit of narcissistic supply, etc., etc. I mean, just have a look at a typical junkie and you would see the narcissist. Only a junkie is addicted to a substance, and the narcissist is addicted, addicted to feedback. This, this used to be the prevailing view, and this is the view enshrined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the Bible of the psychiatric profession, at least in North America. Right. Recently, there are new developments um, in which I'm both a pioneer and heavily involved, and this, we are trying to 
we're trying to have a new, a fresh look at narcissism. We're trying to, mm. to consider narcissism as a post-traumatic condition because most narcissists uh, have been subjected to abuse, abusive treatment in early childhood, to a traumatic environment, mm. to traumatic events, and so on and so forth. And so we begin to think that maybe narcissism is actually not, not a personality disorder, but simply a post-traumatic condition, a reaction to trauma. Mm -hmm. And so this, plus the addiction that I mentioned, plus the fact that narcissists find it a bit difficult to regulate their moods, so perhaps a mood disorder. And so we're beginning to, to have a totally new look at, at narcissism with the hope of offering some kind of behavior modification, long-term behavior modification, maybe even a cure. That's where the field is at right now. I see. So that kind of makes sense to me because, I mean, my very, very layman's understanding of how narcissists are kind of made, so to speak. They, what the, well, from what I've read, it, it seems like it's on a continuum. On one side, it's the extreme pedestalization of a child from parents. You know, you're so great, you're so wonderful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's mm -hmm. that side of it. And then on the other side are, you know, your classic, you know, abuse, you know, True. you know, abuse of the children and all that sort of thing. So in either case, it's environmental. So yes. yeah, that, that seems to make sense to me. Well, there seems to be a genetic component. No one has discovered it hitherto, but there seems to be some genetic component because uh, children exposed to the very same environment, very same family, very same treatment, even identical twins. One of them becomes a narcissist and the other doesn't. Many children, <laughs> become, co many children become codependent or borderline, which is exactly opposite of narcissists. Right. Narcissists are incapable of accessing their emotions, except negative emotions such as anger or hatred or envy. Borderlines and codependents actually are hyper-emotional. They, they, they are skinless. Uh, borderlines and codependents have empathy. Narcissists have only cold empathy, the ability to scan people and immediately spot their vulnerabilities and weak points in order to penetrate and, and manipulate them. So, so we have identical twins. One of them becomes a narcissist and the other one, other one becomes borderline or codependent. So we, we, we believe that there, there might be some genetic predisposition. But you're right that all narcissists have de developed in abusive environments. The only thing that people don't realize is that putting, taking a child, a tender child, a small child, a toddler, and putting him on a pedestal and encouraging in him a sense of entitlement, incommensurate with any effort or accomplishment in real life, using the child to realize the parent's unfulfilled dreams and wishes and fantasies, conditioning love or conditioning the giving of love on performance, and if the child doesn't perform, he's denied that love or even chastised. Or... So all these things are also forms of abuse. Ab abuse. Abuse can and should be defined as the breach of the child's emerging boundaries. As, yes, children, as children grow up, they try to separate from their parents. And this process is called separation, individuation. The child separates, thereby becomes, and thereafter becomes an individual. Uh, bad parenting, narcissistic parenting, makes sure that the child never separates and therefore ne never becomes a full-fledged uh, individual. This can be done either via the traditional, so to speak, methods of sexual abuse, of uh, uh, um, psychological and verbal abuse, and of physical abuse, beating and battering, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it can be done by rendering the child an extension of the parent, an integral part of the parent by merging with the child, by fusing with the child. Mm. Uh, and so the child can never become independent in, in both cases. And both cases are abuse. Both cases are forms of abuse. Pampering and spoiling and placing the child on a pedestal, idolizing the child, forcing the child to conform to preconceived notions of what the child should and should not do, imposing on the child a profession, a future, and a scenario. All these things are... are I would even say more abusive than the classic forms of abuse. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's that's very interesting. I see a lot of that going on 
in black American society. I don't know how familiar you are with the ins and outs of black American life, but I see a lot of that happening in black American life, particularly uh, between black mothers and their children, um, mm -hmm. black mothers and their sons. I see a lot of that going on. I want to ask you about the, the, because narcissism, when it's discussed online, is discussed elsewhere. It's usually in the context of relationships, you know, marriages, things of that nature. And it's almost always discussed in the context of a male who is the narcissist and the female is the victim. In other words, you know, he's the perpetrator and he's a you know pathological narcissist and she's the long suffering victim. And I'm not denying that that's true, but what do we make of the idea? See, I, my personal opinion is that we have female narcissists as well. And that doesn't seem to get as much attention or airtime. And I wanted to get your thoughts about all that. When I started my work in 1995, narcissism was utterly unknown, definitely online. And I've written a body of work which for well over 10 years has been the only resource available. There was no other website, for example, except mine. And there was no other support group except uh, the support groups that I've established and so on. So for 10 years, I kind of monopolized the field. During these 10 years, I've written two distinct um, corpora, two distinct bodies of, of uh, articles and papers and so on. One of them dealt with relationships and one of them dealt with social phenomena. Obviously, the relationship one has been picked up and the social phenomena uh, writings have been ignored. But narcissism is an organizing principle. It is a way of making sense of the world. It is a way of imbuing institutions, social interactions, interpersonal interactions, organizational uh, social units, such as the family or the community or the state even. Mm -hmm. Narcissism is simply all pervasive. It imbues and, and it, it permeates every, every type of interface between human beings. Relationships is a facet of narcissism because narcissists are not capable of intimacy because narcissists do not love themselves, they actually loathe and hate themselves, unbeknownst to them, <laughs> they're not self-aware of it. They're not aware of it, but they are. So because of that, because, uh, because they lack the most basic prerequisites to loving other people, empathizing with other people, and thereby maintaining healthy relationships with other people, they're incapable of intimacy. And so the narcissism has a grave and devastating and irreversible impact on, re on interpersonal relationships, not only in marriages, but, for example, in the workplace. That's, that's true, but that is reducing narcissism to a one-dimensional view. When narcissism is actually a much, much bigger phenomenon, it's arguably the single most powerful explanatory principle there is if you take narcissism, and only narcissism, you can explain so much, even without resorting to anything else. You can explain modern technology. You can explain current politics. You can explain uh, marriages. You can explain disintegration of communities and so the social fabric, and so on and so forth, using only pathological narcissism as a guiding line. For... So... Oh, hold on a second. Let me let me let me stop you right there, uh, Professor, because you just laid out what what some would consider a kind of unified field theory True. that explains a range of phenomena across domains, personal True. and interpersonal, social, collective. So so you you said technology, on the job, marriage. So let's just start with there. How how does not pathological, as you like to put it, malignant narcissism? inform our technology landing on the moon social media the automobile the whole mcgilla could you explain that well narcissism is a natural reaction at the very early stages of life to the need to be seen the baby the newborn the infant need to be seen in order to survive obviously if the child is not seen not noticed uh, the child is incapable of catering to his or her own needs. The child cannot mm. feed, feed himself. The child right. cannot take care of himself, etc. So not being seen early on is tantamount to a life-threatening situation. Right. 
life is about being seen. The precondition for growing up and becoming an adult is that you are seen in childhood. Hmm. We carry this need to be seen well into adulthood. We want to be noticed, we want to be seen, and so on. But what do you do when there's a population explosion? What do you do when you compete with 7.6 billion other people for attention, for scarce attention, ever more scarce because of the information glut? What do you do then? You try to stand out. And you try to stand out in every which way possible because primordially, atavistically, primitively, fundamentally, you feel that if you're not noticed and you're not seen, you are as good as dead. Hmm. It, is, it is a death-defying act. Narcissism is a death-defying act. So you try to stand out and try to stand out by, with the way you, via the way you dress, the way you speak, your ideas or beliefs, your actions. Your, and so you, this, would lead, this leads to escalation and radicalization. Because, you know, you're competing with 7.6 other billion other people. And they all are doing essentially the same thing. So you need to, to, you need to be different. You need to be unique. The emphasis is on uniqueness at any cost. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, this sits well with the values of our current civilization. Our current civilization, for example, emphasizes competitiveness. It emphasizes mm -hmm. ambition. It emphasizes ruthlessness emphasizes materialism, emphasizes possessions and accomplishments, and it's, it's quantitative and numerical civilization as opposed to previous civilization, which have been qualitative. So um, our civilization tallies well, sits well with the need to be seen. It encourages the, the need to be seen. If any, then if you are seen, it's considered to be an accomplishment, hence the celebrity culture. Everything right. you see around you, the technology, reflect all the technologies that we see around us, reflect this fundamental need to be seen and the values that correspond um, um, to it. You mentioned the landing on the moon. Right. What, was the, what was the landing on the moon? The landing on the, on the moon was a one-upmanship race between the United States and the USSR. That's Who's right. going to get... Who has who is going to get there first? Yeah, it was it was um, it was an utterly narcissistic act. By the way, uh, an act with extremely dubious scientific value, a gigantic essentially waste of resources on a status symbol. Oh come on, Doc! We got Tang out of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> So I'm a physicist, by the way. So whatever I really? say, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a doctorate <clears throat> in physics. So I, it's, oh. uh, it's, um, it, it was, um, it was a status symbol, as as the exact equivalent of buying a luxury car, or a flashy, you know, flashy clothing or apartment or whatever. So, so, uh, so let me just walk this back real quick. So 1957 comes, the Russians put the Sputnik one in in, in the space in orbit. Uh, it's the end of the Eisenhower era. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, is elected in 1960 in his inaugural address. He makes it clear we're going to put man on the moon, you know, before the decade ends. And you're saying that's all really just a narcissistic display between the United States and, and the Soviet Union. It was not disguised. It was in the open. The United States clearly was rattled by the fact that Sputnik pinged Washington as it passed above it, over it. it I mean, it was the USSR and, and, the, and the United States were arm wrestling. Arm mm. wrestling in, in, with, the, with, the greatest, uh, with the greatest audience ever via television and so on. So that's an example of a narcissistic act. But very on, often, on a global scale. On a global scale. Very often, though, we tend to, I think, uh, put the horse before the cart, although horses and carts are a bit obsolete, where where I come from, but still. Mm. We, we tend to put the horse before the cart. We tend to say that technology creates narcissism. That's, um, that's manifestly untrue. Narcissism creates technology. technology mm. Technologies cater to deeply deep-set psychological needs. It is grassroots pressure that yields one way or another technology. And so it's not that Facebook 
created the selfie created narcissism. It's that narcissism, uh, groundswell of narcissism, is documented in the studies of Campbell, Twenge, and other psychologists. There's a groundswell of narcissism that over the last 30 years, from 1987 to 2016, well-documented years, uh, at least among college uh, college uh, freshmen and college uh, students, Mm -hmm. this groundswell of narcissism drove technology. And so uh, very often technology is a mirror that reflects belatedly underlying, unconscious sometimes, hidden collective currents. And I think the biggest current by far is narcissism today. That has been identified long ago, not by me, but by Christopher Lash, who in 1974 wrote the book, The Cultural Narcissist, The Culture of Narcissism. I see. And so uh, all our current technologies, I think without exception, cater to narcissism, enhances, enhance it, surf the wave of narcissism, um, augment narcissism, um, are synergetic with narcissism, or blatantly, uh, promulgate and propound narcissism as a value. And so to any everything you've mentioned actually, starting with the car and ending with, uh, with social media mm-hmm. uh, has to do with narcissism. Don't now, forget it's interesting the, the you first... mentioned that though, Doc, because Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook while he was still a student at Harvard and mm-hmm. originally, the original intent was to it was kind of sort of, I don't know if I would call it a dating app, but it definitely was an app for nerdy guys to rate hot or not women on the site. That's how I was originally uh, conceived, my understanding of it. Well, not the internet. The, the internet was conceived by DARPA, which was a, a Pentagon uh, defense uh, agency. Right. I'm, so, talking about, I'm talking about Facebook. I'm sorry. Not the internet. Facebook. Right. Facebook, yes. Facebook was originally conceived as an, as an app. It was limited for, for its first few years. It was limited only to college, um, college seniors, if I remember correctly. Right. And the, it was not open. It wasn't public. Only if you were a college senior, you could uh, sort of uh, plug in or become a subscriber. Right. Uh, even, even the web address was different. It wasn't Facebook.com. It was, I think, the Facebook or something like that, dot .com. Right. And so, yes, it, it was a essentially a combo dating app and nerd exchange. Absolutely true. And in this sense, of course, reflected the underlying values and psychodynamics of college students in the United States. Mm-hmm. And as I repeat, as, as has been amply documented between 1987 and 2016, the narcissism has quintupled, pathological narcissism has quintupled in this population during this period. So there's no way to say that these apps have not been designed with narcissism in mind, or at least in the unconscious. Hmm. Now, now, what, the, what is the... So, so Zuckerberg and his compatriots were narcissists looking to achieve what with Facebook? What were they looking to achieve? No, I don't think they, they sat one evening and said, listen, we are narcissists. We have to, we have to construct an app that will cater or uh, resonate with our narcissism. I, I don't think it's what they, <laughs> and they would they would deny they would deny that they are narcissists because if you look at the early early pr- pronouncements by the founders of Twitter and Facebook and so on and so forth, they are all very altruistic, very socially aware, very you know fa- uh, uh, Zuckerberg, social justice warrior types. Yeah, social justice unifying the world. Zuckerberg was talking about one world, um, and Twitter, Twitter, the Twitter founder. Um, regretted the fact that the 140 character limit won't allow the expression, the unbridled expression of deep emotions and what have you. It was all very touchy feely. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that the design principles and definitely the algorithms chosen reflected the psychodynamic composition, the souls of the people who invented them. Right. And one major component was narcissism. Unbeknownst to them, I believe fully, I don't see any malicious intent here. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But unbeknownst to them, the fact that they were already highly narcissistic, infected, because it's it's a virus. Narcissism narcissism can be amply described using techniques from epidemiology as a kind of viral infection. So these people were heavily infected. 
And they, they, it's like if you would ask zombies to design an app, the app would contain uh, features and so on which would cater to the needs of zombies. It's, it's inevitable, simply inevitable. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's precisely what happened. Over time, so, 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 so is the social media today, because it's been around social media as we understand it, it's been around better part of a decade, give or take. So are you suggesting that this social media, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and so on, are you suggesting, doctor, that not only was it created by narcissists unbeknownst to their own impulses, but it's also creating more narcissists? Well, to start with, the people who created all social media without a single exception were white, they were young, they were schizoid, with the exception of Zuckerberg, but Zuckerberg didn't really create Facebook. He well, hold on, hold on a second. You said schizoid, as in schizoid parent, uh, 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 no, uh, no, no, paranoid? No, schizo- not schizophrenia, schizoid. Schizoid means uh, people who are introverted, people who are not very good in society. And don't I see, new, gotcha. Don't feel, loners. Loners don't feel the need gotcha. to socialize gotcha. and so on. So gotcha. we, we all know that coders and programmers are basically, you know, solitary. Very types. solitary people, yeah. Yeah. So they were they were white. It's extremely important, by the way. They were white. It's a crucial point. The apps are white apps. They don't sit well with crowds in China, in Russia. Consequently, in China and Russia, China and Russia have their own Facebooks. And and uh, and uh, so on. So, from but wait a minute, but, but Russians are white. I mean, I mean, if you stood next yeah. to Vladimir <laughs> Putin, I couldn't tell the difference. Russians are white, but their culture is largely Asian. Not not so. So I was I was starting to say that they were white. They were young. They were mostly schizoid, with the exception of Zuckerberg, who didn't really invent the technology. He just okay. leveraged it for commercial gains. So they were schizoid. They were narcissistic. They were Western. It's a very crucial point. They were Western and so on. They created an app in their own image, like God. And they felt God, God-like because they're narcissists. They felt divine in some way. And their, their goals, I mean, can you imagine a college dropout talking about uniting the world? Isn't this hmm. grandiose? Isn't yeah. it utterly yeah. grandiose? Yeah, that's, that's so, a telltale sign of narcissism yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Of course it is. I mean, it's yeah. an utterly grandiose goal. Coming out with an app, mind you. So, uh, and then when these apps were unleashed on the world, uh, because of the dominance of American infrastructure in the early internet, they became kind of default apps. We call it uh, uh, first mover advantage. They had a first mover advantage. Early adopters and so on and so forth had no choice but to latch onto these apps. And so they, they accumulated a critical mass, which gave them uh, ne- a network effect. So gave them an advantage, commercial and competitive edge. edge. But later on, uh, people around the world started to feel extremely uncomfortable and ill at ease with these apps. Because it was clear that these apps reflect American values, American, the American ethos, so-called the American dream, or the American nightmare, depending where you are. Right. And and reflected a, a slice of Americana, which was young, college educated, white, narcissistic, schizoid, nerdy, uh, socially inapt, sometimes asocial or antisocial, etc., etc. It is an amazing. Well, since you're, since, you're, since you're ticking off all the identity politics, you know, uh, identifier boxes, we have to include male as well. Yes, and male, of course, men, absolutely. So this is what I'm saying, that the technologies, and especially modern technologies and so on, they didn't create this, this uh, they didn't create narcissism. <laughs> they were created by these profiles. They didn't create the profiles. They were created by these profiles. And exactly like in the fashion industry, where the bulk of the fashion industry was created by gay men. That's right. And they imposed their aesthetic standard, their beauty ideal on women all over the world. True, true. Trying to convert women into prepubescent boys. Hmm. And so exactly the same happened in modern internet technology. 
these people try to convert the entire world in their image. They try to, to render people less sociable. And that's the irony in the, in the phrase social media. It's absolutely a social media. Mm-hmm. They try to addict people to screens and screen time rather than to intimate relationships because intimate relationships compete with screens on eyeballs and on monetizing eyeballs. I mean, if you, if you look at your girlfriend, you're not looking at Facebook. Right. So if you're looking right. at your girlfriend, you're not looking at Facebook. So your girlfriend is competition to Facebook, period. I mean, there's no, no, no way to debate this. It's indisputable. Right. You have right. a limited time on this earth. Either you dedicate this time to Mark Zuckerberg or you dedicate this time to your family. Right. So, so they try to convert everyone to be asocial, to be a loner, not to have intimate relationships, to be male-oriented or male-dominated, to be white in, in the sense of values, middle-class um, white values. To be so are you saying? Are you seriously saying, Doc, that a oh, middle class value is a white value? Of course, middle class values have been created by whites exclusively <laughs> over centuries. What are you saying that they are not? Who created them? You have adopted the American dream and the American ethos, which is essentially right. a Puri- Puritan seventeenth century ethos, the the Protestant work ethic. Right. You have, as as Weber called it, you have adopted it in large part. Because social mobility in the United States uh, entailed the adoption of these values. If you didn't adopt these values, you could not be socially mobile. Right. And then, but this, you... but this is a big point of contention in Black America. I don't know if you know this or not, but this is a big point to this, to this day, a huge point of contention uh, within Black America itself. If you go on social media and what have you, the idea of a Black person using me, for example, somebody like me who was a for 22 years right out of high school a, a skilled blue collar tradesman and worked hard and and played by the rules and middle class values and all the rest of it i would be regarded today as an uncle tom as a sellout mm-hmm. that i'm that i'm that i'm a, a oreo you know i'm i'm black on the outside but white on the inside i'm you know i'm a traitor to the race and all this sort of thing and that the outlaw the 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 drug dealer corner boy a miscreant, knucklehead, he's somehow authentically black. Well, um, that's your question is a value judgment, and I'm a scientist. I don't deal with values, I deal with facts. It right. is a fact that the set of values that comprise the so-called American dream and the American ethos, this set of values is exclusively white. Not All right. Only is, not only is it exclusively white, it's specific in time and period of history. It's 17th century. It's Protestant. Right. It's also Protestant, not Jewish or anything, right. and so on and so forth. Now, everyone who comes to the United States has to adhere to, to these values and adopt them if they want to be socially mobile right. and upward mobile, and right. if they want to conform. This, this creates another problem. And again, I'm not, I'm not making any value judgment. I'm not saying that if you adopt these values, you're a traitor to your race because I have no idea what you're talking about. Why would your race not adopt the values of another race? What's the problem with that? We do it all the time. I mean... Uh, well, well, you know, in black America, there's the idea of cultural appropriation. The idea that uh, rap music, for example, this is a ridiculous example I'm going to use anyway. Rap music, hip-hop, which is something I know very well, if... If Sam Vatnin becomes a, a rapper tomorrow, you could be accused by some in black American society as culturally appropriating rap music because Sam Vatnin, he's an Israeli Jew. How dare he take the black uh, cultural expression and make money from it, etc. cetera, so forth. That's, that's the argument. I think that's, that's a, ridiculous, but, but that's the argument. That's the core of, of the Nazi ideology. Absolutely. That was the core of, uh, of exclusionary ideologies such as Nazism. The belief that cultures are sharply delineated, uh, demarcated, and that they are proprietary. In other words, that a culture belongs to a group of people. Right. And this group of people share a, a, a common genetics. So this is a racist Nazi idea, which, by the way, uh, was stolen from the Jews because 
<laughs> because if you if you read oh the uh, irony <laughs> it's irony yes and there's a famous book by um, by George Steiner it's called the transportation to San Cristobal of A H the book is an imaginary um, imaginary piece of fiction where a group of Mossad agents uh, the intelligence agency of Israel a group of Mossad yeah. agents uh, capture uh, Adolf Hitler he's discovered in some jungles in Paraguay or some other got forsaken place and he's kidnapped by these Mossad agents and he's transported back to a city called San Cristobal on the way to Israel and on the way his captors the Mossad agents who are Jews of course and Israelis they converse with Adolf Hitler and they ask him why did you do it to us why did you why did you embark on the Holocaust why did you kill us and he said listen I've learned everything I've learned everything from you guys I mean, I just took your ideas. You were the ones who came up with the idea that there's a chosen people hmm. and that the chosen people is ge a genetically based category. Hmm. You were the ones. You were exclusionary. You excluded the rest of the world. You said that you are unique. You're chosen by God. You are on, on a hmm. mission and so on and so forth. I just, hmm. you know, I just imitated you. I admire hmm. you, actually, he said. Which is true in reality, by the way. Hitler admired the Jews. So, hmm. so, um, I mean, to say that any genetically linked group of people, genetic group of people which, which share some genetics, have a proprietary exclusive hold on cultural treasures is absolutely a racist, exclusionary, Nazi ideology. Absolutely. Hmm. Which, which is, I mean, I use hip hop as an example. Now, I know a lot about hip hop as a DJ and turntablist since I was a teenager. And I knew for a fact, you know, because I'm old enough to, 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 I'm 50. So I'm old enough to know about hip hop's early beginnings. Hip hop was never a black thing, there was always different cultures and races and genders for that matter, both men and women that were involved in hip hop from its earliest beginnings. So when I listen to these black folks today attempting to say, you know, thus and so individuals culturally appropriating our music or our hairstyles or whatever else. That's ridiculous. That's, that's every, utterly ridiculous. Every there is no there is no racially pure group. The concept of race is idiotic, scientifically speaking speaking. There is no racially pure group in the world, and especially so uh, black Americans who intermingled with whites, forcibly sometimes raped and so on intermingled with other populations and so on. So there is no, there is no gen genetically pure group of people. And even if there were, which there isn't, even if there were such a group, its contributions would have been to mankind, not to itself. If blacks gave the world hip hop, we should all, we should all be grateful for it. And we should all benefit from it. And we should all practice it. it the Jews, 22.3% of all Nobel Prize winners are Jews. That's right. Jews, Jews comprise 1.9% of global, the global population. And right. yet, yet we have won 22.3% of all right. Nobel Prizes. And by right. the way, if there is any group on earth that can claim somehow to be racially mildly pure, it would be the Jews. But I would have been shocked had any Jewish group said, well, all our discoveries in medicine, for example, belong to us. And if any black in any ghetto in any city uses our vaccines, you know, the vaccinations we have developed or the medicines we have created or, you know, they are appropriating our cultural heritage because we <laughs> discovered these things. I mean, it's ours. Yeah, I mean, you see how ridiculous it sounds, you know? Yeah, it is. Black doctors practice Jewish medicine every single day of the year. Black doctors read Jewish literature. It's called the Bible. Right. I mean, black, blacks read Jewish literature every day of the year in Episcopal churches and, and Baptist churches and so on. Right. They, it's, called, it's called the Bible. We wrote it. It's ours. You're appropriating our literature. Yeah. Are you serious? This yeah, is yeah, really, I mean, utter, you know, unmitigated nonsense. And Doc, I know you know who it is because speaking of narcissism, I know who you know who she is. Lady by the name of Kim Kardashian. Now, let me tell you something. In Black American society, among Black women, she is reviled, 
And the reason why, well, one of the reasons why is because one major reason is because she snagged a very successful man in Kanye West who's black. Okay. Right. So that there's that. But but in in the and and many black women hold the view that as soon as a black man becomes successful, famous, wealthy, rich, etc., they it's, if they do have a black for white, woman, white woman, get a white woman. It's for white man. Yeah, exactly. So there's that. But then the other piece along with that is Kim Kardashian is uh, she has the aesthetics of a black woman. Okay, mm -hmm. big behind mm -hmm. and you know the whole bit. And 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 black women really don't like that. They they feel that she has a hijacked a, a, a black, a culturally appropriated and hijacked <laughs> black women. You don't know, understand, I swear to God. That this is what they believe. You have to take my word for it. You can look up on, you know, in the black sectors of YouTube and, and Facebook and all the rest of it. This is what black women honestly believe that Kim Kardashian and white women like her have essentially hijacked elements of black womanhood and used it with which to poach highly desirable black men. That's the argument. Right. Thereby, Would you consider that depriving, a narcissistic argument? Thereby depriving black women of their natural genetic pool and, and pool of wealth and resources. So it's an unfair competition, as we call it in business. I'm a professor of finance, among other things. So in finance, we call it unfair competition. It's when okay. <laughs> outsiders compete in unfair ways on scarce resources. Well, mating it's, is a competition. We would agree with that, right? I mean, that's just a Darwinian thing. Mating is, is a competition. You, we, we're guys. We have to compete against other guys for desirable females. Why, would it be, why wouldn't it be the other way around? I mean, wouldn't the idea... The very idea that women don't have to compete, or in this case, black women don't have to compete, but black men do, isn't that a narcissistic idea? The relationship between black women and black men is compounded by history, especially slavery, and by the role of black men in family formation throughout, uh, throughout decades and generations. So that's a separate question which we can deal with, if you wish, a bit later. Okay. I, want, though, I want, though, to introduce you to a concept developed by Sigmund Freud, who was a Jew. Um, right. Sigmund Freud developed a concept called the narcissism of small differences. It's an extremely interesting concept. Freud said that groups of people hate each other and cloak this hatred in genetic garb. To say, like, we belong to the same race or same nation or same something, you know, same, same collective. But essentially, he said, it's basic hatred, men-to-men -men hatred. It's just that we tend to aggregate it into collectives and pretend that the collective has some objective, some objective traits and objective qualities that separate it from other collectives and justify the hatred. But he said, the hatred, hatred tends to increase the more similar we are. Not the more dissimilar we are, but the more similar we are. Hmm. He, he discovered in his studies that people who are fundamentally dissimilar, don't look alike, don't speak the same language, don't compete for the same jobs, don't share the same public spaces, etc., etc., these people don't really hate each other, do not hate each other. But when people begin um, to look more and more alike, to sound more and more alike, to share the same mm. institutions, the same public spaces, etc., they begin to hate each other virulently. And so there is the concept, I don't need to tell you, of the uppity, uppity ne negro, the uppity black, <laughs> which is... It's silly to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. This, this... Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so this is exactly a, um, um, a manifestation, expression of Sigmund Freud's narcissism of small differences. It seems that when minorities especially suppressed minorities, especially, especially minorities which are considered inherently inferior one way or another. When these minorities dare to break out of the stereotype, to acquire education, to move into gentrified neighborhoods, to compete with, uh, with the majority on jobs, etc., etc., when they become more similar to the majority, uh, socially upward mobile, they dress the same, talk the same, sound the same, have studied in the same educational institutions, compete for the same jobs and sometimes get the jobs, etc., etc. When they become similar, the hatred grows. One could have predicted 
one could have predicted based on Sigmund Freud's work that hatred towards blacks will become much more virulent and much more institutionalized as blacks progress, make progress. And therefore, one could have predicted in the 1960s during the civil rights movement that the situation in the in the uh, the situation 50 years later today would be right. much worse much worse in many respects than for example in the 1970s or 80s and mm. based on this work by Sigmund Freud and of course the the major example of this the most well known example are the Jews as long as the Jews kept to themselves as long as they dressed distinctively as long as they maintained their own educational institutions exclusive institutions right. As long as they resided in ghettos and were not mm -hmm. allowed out of the ghettos, as long as they were allowed to exercise only a specific set of professions and vocations, they were right. not allowed. They were allowed only to lend money and, you know, um, trade right. and so on. As long as they were, in other words, confined, quarantined in a way, there was no real hatred. I mean, there were pogroms here and there. People were, you know, assassinated. But we, we were talking about like 30 people, 50 people, 100 people. The minute the Jews were emancipated, the minute they were allowed out of the ghettos, they started to wear ties and suits. They started to graduate from academic institutions together with non-Jews, Gentiles. And then they started to compete on jobs. And then they started to gain an advantage over the majority. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was then that the Holocaust happened. The Holocaust, mm. Holocaust was a direct reaction to apity Jews, Jews who didn't know their proper place, Jews who tried to look like Germans, sound like Austrians, behave like the French, eat and drink like, uh, I don't know, the Swedes. That was not the place of the Jews. They should not have been like that. And so the majorities, majorities, because every single nation in Europe participated in the Holocaust, the majorities of European nations coalesced and work together to kill the Jews. Hmm. The same happened with the blacks. Civil rights movement led to a partial eman emancipation. Not total, but partial emancipation. Right. So blacks began to study, well, with the, with the, you know, there was segregation, then segregation was gone. So blacks began to study with whites. Then they began to, the graduation rates climbed up. Blacks began to move into white-only neighborhoods. Blacks hmm. began to compete for jobs. Blacks hmm. became mayors. Blacks became outspoken intellectuals and so on. They right. became they became too white for their own good, <laughs> and this and this provoked the narcissism of small differences, the virulent hatred that we are witnessing now. Black Lives Matter is reacting. This is a movement that is reacting to true problems, not to imaginary one. There, there is no black paranoia. There, it's I mean this, it's true that police departments all over the United States are institutionally assassinating blacks. That's not paranoia. And so, but I want to compare it and connect it to narcissism via the work of Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Obsidian Radio, the live stream show. I'm your host, Mumi Obsidian Ali. Got an exclusive interview, interview with the world-renowned expert on malignant narcissism. Uh, Dr. Sam Vaknin, uh, we conducted this interview. He's all the way in uh, his hometown of Scott Ye, uh, Macedonia. I had to learn how to pronounce that properly. He educated <laughs> no me one very no one well does. on no that. One does. Take it easy. No one does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're having a heck of a conversation about narcissism and its various permutations and iterations, how it manifests itself uh, uh, personally, interpersonally, socially, collectively, globally. In terms of tech, in terms of relationships, mating, the, the whole gamut, and we're going to continue. Uh, uh, Doctor Vack, and you uh was talking about, and I and I wrote down in my notes here, uh, the 21st century, which I refer to based on the work I've read of you and others. I consider the 21st century the narcissist century, and uh, it sounds like what you're saying here seems to be in alignment with that. You even said that uh, there were entire occupations and career paths that were specifically suited and geared for the narcissistic personality. Could you could you speak a, a little bit to that? Yeah. I think, as I've said before, that 
uh, our civilization is founded on essentially narcissistic values or values that would tend to reward, would tend to encourage narcissistic behaviors because they would be adaptive behaviors. They would lead to good outcomes. And of course, the, the best example would be Donald Trump. Donald Trump is president of the United States. There is no doubt in my mind and in the mind of dozens of other narcissism experts that he is a malignant narcissist bordering on psychopath. And yet he became president of the United States. So one could say, looking at the situation objectively, remember, I don't judge, I'm a scientist. One could, right. say, one could say that Donald Trump's behavior and personality um, are adaptive in the sense that they led him to success. They led him to accomplishments, unprecedented accomplishments, unparalleled. So in uh, July, I think 2017, if my memory doesn't fade me, New Scientists, which is one of the two leading science magazines in the world, the other one being Scientific American, New Scientists had a cover story. And the cover story was, parents, teach your children to be more narcissistic. Hmm. And new scientists explained this provocative um, front cover um, expose, explained it by saying, well, the world has changed. The world now rewards, uh, the world looks positively on um, narcissistic and psychopathic traits and behaviors. There are scholars all over the world. Kevin Dutton comes to mind in the United Kingdom and others. There are scholars of all, all over the world who now begin to say that narcissism is actually a productive adaptation, and they call it the productive narcissist or the high-functioning high narcissist. They say that in certain professions and in certain positions, for example, politician, leader, um, the leader of a nation, or for example, surgeon, medical surgeon, they say uh, police, um, law, law enforcement, uh, uh, judicial system, they say that in certain professions, being a narcissist or being a psychopath endows one with a relative edge, with a competitive advantage. Hmm. So, for example, if you are the leader of a nation and you have to send people to be killed in Iraq or in Afghanistan, of course, as a psychopath, it would be, you, you know, it would be much easier because you don't have empathy, you don't have conscience, you don't have, you're ruthless, you're reckless. So, a psychopath is much better suited to lead a nation in war, at war. Um, psychopath is also much better suited to perform operations on human bodies because you have to cut them open. Right. It's, a, it's an act of butchery, technically mm. speaking. A narcissist would be better suited to lead uh, big corporations, to be the chief executive officer of Fortune 500 corporations because a narcissist um, has a kind of uh, view that emphasizes... Um, material and quantitative accomplishments at any cost, has no empathy or, or has actually called empathy, which allows him to discern the weaknesses and so on in competitors and to take advantage of them, etc., etc., etc. The idea that narcissism and psychopathy are actually evolutionary adaptations, that actually people who are narcissists and psychopaths will survive, will have better survival rates and will be able to pass on their genes, they will be able to better mate. They, because they are much better adapted to the world as it is today. That's a newly emergent idea and not entirely laughable or, or uh, risible. And if this is true, and I happen to believe it's true, <clears throat> then indeed the next century will be the century of the narcissist. Uh, a book, there was a book published um, called the narcissism epidemic. Uh, I coined the phrase narcissism epidemic in 95, and I was gratified to see it finally in print uh, with a major academic institution. So the, the claim in that book is that narcissism is an epidemic. It's on the rise and so on and so forth. I added later the touch that narcissism or the spread of narcissism can be easily construed or studied via epidemiology. The narcissism is a kind of virus. We have the concept of meme. Meme is, uh, is like a gene, but it's verbal. It's an idea. How, right. ideas, how ideas spread. Narcissism is, not, is, a, narcissism is, not, is a construct. It's not only an idea. It's an idea. It's a value system. It's a set of prescriptive behaviors. It tells you how to behave. 
So when you're a narcissist, you have a set of values, you have a set of ideas which support these values, a philosophy of narcissism, and you have a set of prescriptions how to behave to obtain maximal beneficial results. It's very tempting. To be a narcissist is a total solution. You don't need to look beyond narcissism. In this sense, therefore, narcissism is an ideology akin to communism, akin to capitalism. I think what will happen in the 21st century is competition between narcissistic ideologies, such as Anglo-Saxon capitalism, and non-narcissistic ideologies. And I think social media, for example, will, will um, uh, participate in this global conflict. It will be an ideological world war, global war. I think, for example, one of the predictions I make is that the rise of social me media is at its end. I think we are reaching the phase that in virology, the study of viruses, we call self-limitation. That's when the virus stops infecting people, mysteriously. Just stops. Because if the virus continues to infect people, there will be no people left, and the virus itself will die, die out. So the virus has mechanism to stop itself from infecting people. Similarly, I think the social media is now at this self-limitation stage and will stop. At that point, the world population will, will be divided in two. Those who are addicted to social media, conditioned by social media, and unable to interact with the world except via social media or technology, and those who uh, abstain from social media, untethered, uh, go back to basics, the retro mm. movement. And then mm. we will have these two populations. And the first population, around 2 billion people, mostly Western, mostly white, the first population will adopt the narcissistic ideology. It's, narcissistic ideology is an amalgam of capitalism, selfishness, ruthlessness. If you want to see the prime ideologist of narcissism, that would be Donald Trump. So don't Trumpism, if you want. So mm. this group that uses social media will be Trumpist. It will be narcissistic capitalist. It will also be white, predominantly white. And all others will be, will be fighting a rearguard action against the narcissistic ideology. I'm saying rearguard action because narcissism is going to win. It's going to win simply because it has no inhibitions, no restraints and no constraints. It has no empathy. It has no compassion. It has no uh, holdbacks. It has no, I mean, it's unbridled. It's ruthless. It's reckless. So, of course, narcissism will win. Um, and this let, is let what me, I force. I, I, I just want, yeah, I just want to jump in there because uh, you said a number of things with regard to Trump and the American presidency. I just wanted to push back a little bit, play a little bit of devil's advocate. I'm not denying what you're saying with regard to Trump lends itself to narcissism. And, and you said even bordering on uh, psychopathy. Okay, that's fair. But what do you say about uh, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama? I mean, these were uh, Barack Obama said when he was inaugurated uh, or, or I should say rather when he won the presidency election night, he said he wanted to transform America. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a, a grandiose claim to make of a nation of over 300 million people? Two years before Obama was uh was nominated as candidate, presidential candidate, two years before. I wrote an article, Barack Obama, narcissistic or, uh, narcissist or merely narcissistic. Huh. This, art, this article was replicated on one million websites and appeared in, in numerous print publications and so on. So you're preaching to the choir. I was the first by far to suggest that Barack Obama is a narcissist. I also agree with you that current, the current crop of leadership, when I say current, I mean more or less from the 1980s, the current crop of leadership is increasingly more and more and more narcissistic and psychopathic. And that is not a phenomenon limited to the United States. Political leadership is, ne is a rear guard action. Political leadership is, is not a harbinger, it's a follower. Hmm. Political leadership is exactly like technology. It reflects underlying social and psychodynamic trends. It doesn't create them. I, Adolf Hitler was a creature of his time, not the other way. 
Mm-hmm. And so is Donald Trump, and so is Bill Clinton, and so is, so is Barack Obama. But if you look elsewhere, if you look outside the confines of the United States, right. and Americans are very provincial because they, yes, have this con- they have this continent and they never look out. That's right. But if you look outside, you will see that the world is infested with Donald Trumps. You have Bolsonaro in, um, in Brazil. You have Erdogan in Turkey. You have Putin in Russia. You have uh, Duterte in the Philippines. They are all Trumps, wannabe Trumps, have been Trumps, would be Trumps. Hmm. Trump is merely the culmination and reification of uh, narcissistic social trends and, and psychological trends. But I agree with you that he had, he had predecessors. Um, he is much more virulent than Barack Obama. In this sense, he's a malignant narcissist, while Barack Obama was merely a grandiose narcissist. But yes, both of them were narcissists. I agree fully. I'm the one who said it. <laughs> I'm the one who said it first. That's well, okay. Uh, okay. So then Steve Bannon, who, you know, Breitbart fame, some would say infamy, and a former White House staffer, very close advisor to Trump, he would be right that Trump represents uh, this global populist surge that you would argue is really just following behind the globalist surge in narcissism overall and these guys are just manifestations of it there is there was a brewing the the a battle was brewing between the elites the global elites and the and the masses the elites were constantly humiliating the masses they created what we call in psychology narcissistic injury the elites treated the masses as dispensable as trashy as low bro as uh, as retards as and and they were stealing and they were rapacious we see it in income inequality when we study income inequality i mean amazing things the hundreds re- hundred richest people on earth have wealth equal to the lowest 3.9 billion people mm. there has been and this battle has been going on for well over 70 years immediately started immediately after the second world war I see. and finally the masses have had it they simply have had it, but they have had it narcissistically. And that's the difference, because I think we're entering a period which is the exact equivalent of the period in Europe between 1789 and 1917. In 1789, we had the French Revolution. In 1917, we had the Russian Revolution. And in between these two revolutions, all the social institutions uh, in Europe collapsed or vanished. That includes empires, uh, some nation states, the aristocracy. Everything fell apart Mm -hmm. because the masses have risen. But the masses have risen in that period between 1789 and 1917. The masses have risen for economic reasons. The masses have risen for ideological reasons. The masses have risen... Uh, because they wanted to redistribute wealth or because they uh, uh, were fighting for social justice or, I mean, the the reasoning, the driving force behind these revolutions, behind these 150 years of revolutions, the driving force was altruistic, not narcissistic. Mind you, all these revolutions ended badly. They all ended with, with suppression, dictatorship, mass genocide, I mean, they ended badly. But the intentions were good. Everything, if you read the literature of that period, it's all altruistic. It's all right. about help, helping humanity. Well, 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 the major revolution that came out of that period, and you mentioned 1917, Marxism. Yes, communism, to be more precise. And so yeah. communism, communism was essentially an altruistic ideology. It was implemented, of course, horribly. And so on, but it was uh, it's it's altruistic. If you read the text, they right. are con- they are concerned with the welfare of fellow beings, and that's the difference between that period of revolutions and the period of revolutions that we are entering now. Because make no mistake about it, what's happening today in the world? These are revolutions. The masses are attacking the elites. The masses are attacking the elites in a variety of ways. The masses are, have written their own encyclopedia. It's called Wikipedia. It's hmm. a non, non-elite encyclopedia. It's an anti-expert encyclopedia. It's an encyclopedia edited by teenagers. It's, hmm. uh, it's a rebellion against elitism, 
against authority, against expertise, Wikipedia. So there are many ways to rebel and many types of revolutions. And um, the elites are, in my view, an extinct species. They just don't realize it yet. And there will be bloodshed, a lot of it, soon. We are entering, I, as I told you, a period akin to that period. But the huge difference is this. The revolutions of, of the first period I mentioned were all altruistic. The revolutions that we, we are having now, they are all selfish and narcissistic and atomized. In other words, these are the revolutions we're having now are revenge revolutions. They're hmm. revolutions intended to revenge, to avenge the narcissistic injury, the humiliation, the, the helplessness, the impotence, the, and they are, they are revolutions that involve uh, antisocial sentiments and psychopathic actions. And they are revolutions that are largely passive aggressive, not only aggressive. So they include sabotage and undermining. And they are, they are sick, pathologized, pathological revolutions. And they will lead to a sick, pathologized world, much more than today. So I'm. Now, I'm now, it's interesting you say that, Doctor, because um, I wanted to ask you about this. We talked about this briefly in the run up to today's interview. The Women's March here in the United States, and my understanding is that it's not only spread across the country. My understanding is that it's gone to other countries at this point since the first one when um, uh, President Trump was inaugurated a year right. over a year ago. So you have this Women's March. And the founders of the march were a black woman, a Palestinian woman, mm. a white Gentile woman, I guess you could say, and a Jewish woman. Those were the originals. Right. And then the Jewish woman was ousted mm. by the black and the Palestinian woman. The black woman attended Louis Farrakhan's Savior's Day event of the Nation of Islam in Chicago. That made the big news. And now it's been completely called off on the grounds that the leadership of the Women's March is anti-Semitic. They, they got together in reaction to Donald Trump's election, which goes to your point about narcissistic injury, revolutions of revenge, and all the rest of it. It, it seems to me, the, 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 what I've read about this Women's March, it's completely, I mean, the narcissism is off the chain, but I wanted to get your expert opinion on that. Well, <laughs> that's precisely what I'm saying. The future will not be a clash between narcissists and anti-narcissists. It will be a clash between narcissists, elite narcissists, and mass narcissists. But they will all be united by an organizing principle and an ideology of narcissism. Wow. Simply different types of narcissists. Lowbrow narcissists, uneducated narcissists, ignorant narcissists against, I don't know, Harvard graduate narcissists. Corporate narcissists against shareholder activist narcissists. Politic, politician narcissists against um, electorate narcissists. But everyone will be a narcissist. It will be wow. the explanatory, meaning imbuing principle. It will be the overarching ideology. And it will merge with capitalism. So capitalism itself will be narcissized, if you wish. Everything will be narcissism. <laughs> The question is meaningless. It's like asking about the mid Middle Ages. You know, in the Middle Ages, you had many competing factions. Many countries were at war. There were no countries, but never mind. Many regimes were at war. Right. Many, many noblemen were fighting each other. Many, I mean, Essentially families. I mean, the Game of Thrones was based on the War of the Roses. Yeah. So, but, so in you Middle essentially Ages, had families competing against each other yeah, in different you countries. Had, you had you had all kinds of conflicts. You had religious conflicts, political conflicts. Uh, so, But all these conflicts, all the conflicts, without a single exception, took place within an ideological space, within an ideological sphere, which was religion. Right. All, all of them accepted Catholicism. Right. All of them, all of them were Christian. Right. When when A was fighting B, B claimed to have been the true Christian, and A claimed to have been the true Christian. Right. It's not that A was Christian and B was the Antichrist. They were both Christians fighting each other. Um, and the same will be now. The masses will attack the elites, kill the elites. There will be bloodshed, you will see. The masses will attack the elites, but the masses will be narcissists and the elites will be narcissists. The masses will, will promulgate and propound and prefer and propose narcissistic principles and they will fight the elites 
who will also promulgate and prefer narcissistic principles. Narcissism is the new God. Narcissism is the new religion. That's what I'm trying to say. It's the unifying principle. Everyone will agree that to be a narcissist is good because it's adaptable, because it gives good outcomes, because you should be a narcissist. Or right. the only question will be the, the dividing the loot, the spoils. It will be a fight yeah. over the spoils, not over the principle of it. Now, um, but this, okay, so so the, the women's march piece just followed up on that. So you have this women's march, and I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with the theory of intersectionality it was developed here in the United States by a black feminist scholar, legal scholar. I've always seen intersectionality, uh, doctor, as explained in this way. Giving black women special victim status. Nobody has it harder than the American black woman. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And so therefore, because she's the least, you know, fill in the blank and the most whipped up on and all the rest of it, she should get special dispensation and favors and rights. So I'm seeing these feminists in, in this late date and they're they're basically tearing each other apart over who is the most aggrieved. Like this whole issue with the you know the Jewish woman founder yeah. of of women's market. So, well, you can't be in it because you know you you're a Jew and, and the Jews did this and did that to black people and all the rest. Of it. That was the argument. So 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 yeah. So I wanted to ask you because I want to get into this discussion that you had with Richard Granite about the future being female and all that. I wanted to ask you what is the future of feminism. If indeed narcissism is the order of the day in the 21st century, I tell you, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I think feminism at this point is bullshit. Mm -hmm. I just think it's bullshit. It's, it's run out of gas. All of the aims have been achieved in black American society. Black women will tell anybody that's that, that will bend an ear to listen how educated they are, how accomplished they are. They got it going on. So if that's the argument, what else is there for y'all to be bitching about? Your response? Well, first of all, the distinction between narcissism and victimhood is artificial. One of the major shortcuts to, to achieving narcissistic goals is professional victimhood. So if you, if you, if you self-impute victimhood, if you attribute to yourself victimhood, immediately under the current culture of political correctness and so on, and with academic support, immediately you're entitled to special treatment. One of the diagnostic criteria of narcissistic personality disorder <laughs> in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is the narcissist feels entitled to special treatment. Hmm. So, did you hear that, fellas? For, the, for those listening right now, did you hear what the doctor just said? World-recognized expert on malignant narcissism. He's citing the Bible of uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, the diagnostic the, the statistical manual. One of the telltale signs of a narcissist textbook is the idea that you do, you are deserving of special treatment. This is what he's saying with regard to feminism, the women's march. And I would take it a step further and say black feminism, but we can get into that later. Continue, please, doctor. So any, any self-attribution of victimhood on a professional basis, I call it professional victimhood. And I, I, the difference between the distinction between professional victimhood and a true status of weakness, true state of victimhood, is that professional victimhood is deriving benefits from your victimhood. Not seeking to rectify it, but seeking to eternalize it. Seek, seeking to enshrine it. Because it's beneficial. It's an adaptation. The, the true victim wants to reverse her victimhood, wants to stop being a victim. The professional victim seeks to enshrine or perpetuate her victimhood because it's useful and, mind you, profitable. In this sense, professional victimhood is a manifestation of narcissism because it's about entitlement. And it's not a telltale sign. It's a diagnostic criterion. That's how we diagnose narcissism. So... Feminism has a very long history, much longer than most people know. It started effectively almost 200 years ago, uh, and not in the United States, but in the United Kingdom. Right. So feminism had two strands all along from the very beginning. There was the real victim strand, 
and the entitled or professional victim strand. Again, the mm. narcissistic and non-narcissistic. Mm. The real victims, because women have been victimized for many thousands of years. That happens to be true. They have been victimized. They have been treated as chattel, as property. They have been sold, traded. They have been enslaved. There was a woman slavery movement, the biggest in history, far, far bigger than the, black, than the way the black Americans have been treated far, far bigger than classic slavery in the States, the Caribbean, and so on. So women have been slaves. They are still slaves in many countries. I mean, Afghanistan, Iran, and so on. Right. They, have been, they have been enslaved. And so 200 years ago, there was a backlash against this state of victimhood and a demand for equal rights, voting rights, property rights, etc., etc. That's okay. That's absolutely legitimate. It's the equivalent of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And that has been the healthy face of feminism. The, real, the victims, women victims, wanted to not be victims anymore. They wanted, actually, feminism to go away because it would no longer be necessary. And then, hitchhiking on this, riding on this, parasiting on it, there was militant feminism. Militant feminism is about professional victimhood. Hmm. These are women who perpetuate the state of victimhood, etc., etc., because it endows them with benefits. And it endows them with benefits in a variety of settings, not the least of which is academe, where are there, are there are all kinds of uh, cacamany uh, uh, departments teaching uh, God knows what. I mean, feminist God knows what. So there's a lot of money in feminism, vested money. There's a lot of money in academic study of feminism, a lot of money in, in all kinds of federal grants. There's a lot of money. So it became an industry, an industry of victimhood. And so that I'm not suspected of being anti-black or anti-female, let me compare it to another industry of victimhood, the Holocaust. Right. Jews made a lot of money of the Holocaust. It's one hell of an industry, very big. You, can, you don't have to take my word for it. Go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Yeah. It's big money, not small. The Jewish state, Israel, when it was established, received the equivalent in today's money of about $5 billion from the Germans wow. in, nine, in the 1950s, five years after the Holocaust. They didn't even wait. So Holocaust has always been a big industry and big money. There were Holocaust victims and Holocaust survivors who kept quiet, kept to themselves, tried to recover and to heal the indescribable wounds of this horrible crime. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Holocaust denier. These were the victims who wanted to be victims no more. They did not want to perpetuate the Holocaust in their own minds. But there was an industry of lobbyists, academic researchers, politicians, and businessmen who benefited mightily from the Holocaust. To this very day, every, every movement of victimhood spawns these parasites. Every victim, every movement of victims. Not the least of which is, of course, the black American community, where to this very day there are professional victims who benefit mightily from the study of slavery and, and the analysis of slavery and the benefits that, uh, and blackmailing, emotionally blackmailing the whites, etc., etc. There are always parasites, and there are always malignant expressions of victimhood. The test is simple. If perpetuating victimhood is profitable, then something's wrong. Then something is narcissistic. Hmm. I, I want to follow up on that with this Me Too movement. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with its early beginnings. The early beginnings of the Me Too movement started with, and I'm just going to go ahead and be honest here, not making a value judgment. I'm just making an observation. A truly unfortunate looking black woman by the name of Tarana Burke. Mm -hmm. Tarana Burke founded it on the basis that she wanted to give the victims, there's that word, of sexual assault abuse of black women and girls uh, their shine, I guess you could say. And the movement, in her words, has been hijacked by, and I quote, this comes from Chicago Sun-Times, I'm quoting her directly, uh, Has been her, her movement has been hijacked by pretty girls from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So, 
I wanted to ask you, because I've been trying to study as much as I could about the backstory of Miss Tarana Burke. Is that a narcissistic impulse? I mean, she's been fed it at BET, Black Girls Rock. She's gotten all kind of press. So I'm so my so even if she's right in what you know, white, white, pretty girls from Hollywood kind of you know usurping a movement, even if that's true. It's not like she's an unknown. It's not like her cause is unknown. I mean, what more does she want? I don't even understand the the the, the basic argument. How can one hijack hijack justice? If these pretty girls deserve justice, the fact that they are pretty should not influence uh, the justice that they that is meted out to them. Hmm. Ju justice is a universal good. It it should be accessible to pretty girls from Hollywood as it is to ugly black women. I mean, I don't see why ugly black women should have a monopoly on justice as opposed, <laughs> as opposed to pretty... So, so, pretty so that would be a narcissistic impulse then? Yeah. Well, um, you know... Entitlement to special treatment, exclusive, exclusivity, proprietary, yeah, and so exactly. on. Do, I, do I have that right or do I, do I misunderstand it? Listen, Vic, I'm the victim. What are you doing here? I mean, it's my space. It's my property. I'm making money out of it. I mean, I'm, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a commercial impulse, I would say. Maybe not so much narcissistic, although in a minute I will, I will tell you about situational narcissism. But okay. maybe less narcissistic than commercial. Listen, victimhood is big business. Holocaust is a huge business. Slavery is a great business. I mean, how many blacks live off slavery? I think more blacks live off slavery than... than I mean... How many blacks live of slavery? There is an, mm -hmm. uh, there is an, there are thousands of, of black professors living off slavery to this. Very That's day. right. That's right. I mean, That's right. And not just them. I mean, in, in media, politics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, call them the the professional black. The, yeah. I, I, now, this is what I t I call them. I call them professional blacks, and exactly. their job is to remind everybody about how black they are. Right. That's and their job. Black. And they're professional Jews and professional uh, professional uh, women victims. And prof I mean, it's big money. So I think the initial impulse is commercial. But abusing victimhood for commercial purposes is narcissistic behavior. That's mm -hmm. the thing. It starts with money. But the pursuit of money at any cost to your values, to your upbringing, to uh, social ethics. I mean, if you are ruthless in your pursuit of money, then you are a narcissist. And this is the point. It's not that, listen, it's not that, listen, I've been a victim. Okay, so I'm a victim. I go out to the world. I describe my victimhood and I make a few bucks. That's okay. okay. Right. But, then, but then if I make an industry out of it and I begin to protect my turf and I begin to compete with others and I begin to badmouth others, and I, be, I mean, that's an entirely different ballgame. That's right. narcissism. And now there's, something called, now there's something called situational narcissism. Huh. I situational, hear this. situational narcissism is a concept that was developed in Harvard. They discovered a pretty interesting fact. The belief until that time was that narcissism is an early childhood phenomenon. In other words, you're abused as a child and you react by developing narcissism. And then they found out in a series of studies that people who became famous became celebrities, concurrently developed pathological narcissism late in life. So this was late onset narcissism. Hmm. It's narcissism that you develop as an adult. It was the first time that such a thing was documented. They studied hmm. rock stars, rock stars, football, um, NFL, NBA, right. etc., hmm. etc. And they discovered that among these people, by the way, many of them blacks, like from NBA and so on. So right. they, they discovered among these people there was um, uh, they scored very high on the narcissistic personality inventory and MMPI two. These are two tests. They scored very high on the narcissistic uh, part, and so it meant that technically they were narcissists, but they were not narcissists before. Before they, they were totally healthy, so their narcissism is clearly associated with their newfound status as celebrities. That's a your question regarding that woman. She may have been. Uh, motivated by noble, noble um, intentions. But once she has found herself um, the life of the party, so to speak, once she, is, once she has discovered the limelight, she might well have developed situational narcissism. 
mm. late onset narcissism, adult narcissism. It happens a lot to politicians, to rock stars, to football stars, etc. And um, and then when once you discover narcissism, you remember the beginning of our conversation when we were both much younger, when I said that narcissism is a drug addiction. That's right. So once you discover narcissism, there's no going back. It's intoxicating. The grandiosity, the the you know the flattery, the, it's absolutely intoxic- you want more. And you want more. And then, of mm. course, the threshold goes up. It's not enough. What used to be enough uh, six months ago is not enough anymore. Right. And you escalate your behavior. You radicalize your behavior. You provoke artificial conflicts. You create all kinds of um, spectacles. The drama queen. Guy, the drama queen, exactly. There was a guy called, uh, his name was Guy Debord. Guy Debord. He was a French uh, Marxist uh, philosopher. And he, co- he coined the term the society of the spectacle. He said that we have been transformed from a society of substance to a society that puts emphasis on spectacle and image. And he said that that this means that people will, in order to attract attention and so on, they will continue to generate spectacles. They will become one-man theater troops. And exactly, drama queens. So it induces drama. In, and you see, for example, in Washington politics, I mean, it's much more dramatic than, let's say, what, 50 years ago. You mentioned Eisenhower. I mean, compare politics in Washington, in the swamp, during Eisenhower's time, and compare politics today. The posing in front of the cameras, the the crucial meeting of Democrats with Donald Trump, Donald Trump's antiques, it's all one big spectacle. The number of laws, number of uh, acts passed by Congress only five years ago, was 10 times the number of acts passed this year. 10 times. Hmm. Means Congress is much more preoccupied with grandstanding and political theater and spectacle than with passing bloody acts, which is the main function Hmm. of Congress. That's right. right. So we are in a society of spectacle. And everyone is is an actor on stage, to quote a much bigger figure than me. Shakespeare. That's right. Huh. All right. So uh, you you did you did a. Uh, by the way, before I go any further, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Obsidian Radio, the live stream show. This is an exclusive interview with yours truly and my very special guest, world renowned expert on malignant narcissism, Dr. Sam Vatnin, and uh, we're having a wide ranging discussion on narcissism and what it means for all of us. And uh, in the 21st century, you're talking about race, gender, the whole McGill, all of it. And uh, I'm really glad that he's here and so gracious that he could spend his time talking with us. Professor Vaknin, you um, you had a very interesting range of discussions with Mr. Richard Grannon of the United Kingdom. I know of him because he participated in an event here in the United States called the 21 Convention. That's mm-hmm. how I knew about it. And uh, I watched, I w- watched with great interest and very closely your wide-ranging discussions with him. I just wanted to get on one aspect of it, if I could, and that was the the section of the interviews you had with him where you made the case that the future is female, and you had some pointed words, among other things, with regard to MGTOW and the men's rights movement, the red pillars and so forth. So I just wanted to kind of go into that with you. You, for 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 the benefit of my argument, or my audience rather, could you just briefly lay out your argument about the future being female, and then we'll go into that and go further into that. Humanity went through two phases, two big phases, hitherto, and is entering the third. That's not my invention. That is Alvin Toffler's. So. Uh, the first phase was hunter gather, hunter hunting gathering. It was an environment where women, at the very least, contributed equally to nutrition and controlled all the other functions of life. Right. So men were hunting, and they came back once every two, once in a blue moon, actually, with an antelope or a deer or whatever, and the the bulk of nutrition was actually uh, obtained via gathering, and gathering right. was controlled fully by women and children. Women also raised the children and, and guarded the community when men were away hunting. It stands to reason, although we have no documented proof, of course, it stands to reason that women were pretty dominant in that phase uh, because nine out of ten functions were carried out by women. 
men came back, they had to eat first and they had to eat more than women simply right. because of their energy requirements. It didn't That's reflect right. any social, it reflected the need to maintain the machine. So, and then uh, about 10,000 years ago, 10 to 5,000, depending on the, on the part of the world, there was the agricultural revolution. And at the beginning, there were no tractors and combines and steam diesel, you know, there was, there was only the human muscle. To pull the plow, to plant crops, and to harvest and reap them, you needed to be muscular. You needed to be strong. Right. Uh, nature has it that w uh, men, because of hormonal, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, so I know why, but generally speaking, because of hormonal hormones mainly, men have more muscle mass than women. And so it gave them um, a competitive edge, an advantage. In the age of agriculture and later in the age of industry, which is nothing but an extension of agriculture, the first industries were agriculture based and they processed agricultural inputs. And to this very day, very big part of industry is based on agriculture in effect. So one could say that this is one revolution, the agricultural industrial revolution. During this period, muscle was an advantage and men had muscle, period. So they became dominant, and then they became even more dominant, and then they became utterly dominant, and women became property. And this lasted until more or less uh, the Crimean War, which is eight, the 1860s. Right. What happened in the 1860s were two developments. One, a gradual transition from industry to services and information process, processing, and wars in which millions of men had to participate, as opposed to previous wars, where only thousands of men were participating. So mass wars, or what we call total wars. Total, right. war, total war is a new invention. So when men went to war, whole generations went to war. For example, in World War II, about 80% of the generations, the, of four generations, were extinguished, exterminated in the war. So what happened was women had to fulfill male roles simply because there were no men. As I said, in previous wars, a representative sample of men was sent to fight each other. The bulk of male population remained behind. But in total wars, the entire male population is fighting. And so there are no men. And so women have to work in factories, and they have to pave roads, and they have to do everything that men usually used to do. And so women penetrated classic male um, enclaves, classic male vocations and professions, and classic male fortresses, if you wish. Mm -hmm. Women began to replace men or, uh, seriously. And when men, men returned from the wars, they did not succeed to dislodge women and to regain their previous advantage. Because women discovered the secret that men have guarded for centuries. They don't need men. They can do everything very well by themselves because modern machinery, machinery replaces muscles very efficiently. As the emphasis continued to shift after the Second World War to information processing and services, as machinery replaced muscles via automation and so on, women became equipotent with equal power to men. And then they surpassed men. Today, majority of college and university graduates the world over, with a few exceptions, are women, not men. In many countries, including the United States, women outweigh men in their educational attainment. In many professions, the majority of practitioners are women, and that includes today the judicial professions, medicine, art, and so on. So women are taking over, and they are taking over for two major reasons. Uh, as we said, muscles are dispensable, and more than dispensable, they're not needed. They are absolute, actually, in many respects, muscle bec muscles become a disadvantage. Uh, and, but the most, more important reason 
the skills that provide you with an advantage in a networked world, a world of networks, non-hierarchical world, the women have these advantages and men do not. Women network much more. Women are much more social. Women are much more empathic. Women are much less competitive, so they work in teams much better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Women are much better suited to the modern world than men. Indeed, in some countries, one third of primary breadwinners are already women. I said two things uh, with, I mean, the muscles issue, the networking issue, and the new skills that are required where women are much better suited. But there was actually a third thing. Uh, and this is something that no one has noticed as far as I know. I couldn't find a reference to it in any literature that I've ever seen. Even in MGTOW and Red Pillars, I mean, no one mentions it for some bizarre reason. Um, divorce. Divorce. Mm. Divorce has been the biggest transfer of economic resources by far, in human history. The, when oil went up from $6 to $140, $148, which is quite a rise, you would agree, oh, yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars were transferred from oil consumers to oil producers. The entire transfer of wealth between oil consumers and oil producers is less then nine months, <laughs> nine months of transfer of wealth in a typical year between men and women, from men to women. And how is this done? Divorce. When women divorce, on average, they get half the commun community property, plus alimony, plus child support. What is this if not a transfer of wealth from men to women? If you take into account that 53% of all marriages end in divorce, you can calculate the incredible, breathtaking transfer of money, property, wealth, resources, real estate from men to women. This has been going on for well over 50 years. By my estimate, according to my calculations, men have transferred a total of six trillion dollars to women. Wow. Now you tell me. That's worldwide. You... No, no, no. United States. Oh, oh so you're saying tr six trillion in what the last half a century? Yeah. In the United only, States alone. Only in the United States. If you wow. take into account if you take into account the United States is about a quarter of global GDP. That's right. Well, you could safely assume that about twenty trillion to twenty-five trillion dollars change hands between men and women. Now you tell me the following: if you were to tomorrow to win the lottery and you were to get six trillion dollars, would you be yeah. a powerful? Would you be powerful? Would you be a powerful man? Hell yeah! But that would, would lead me to my next point. If 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 what if your calculations are correct, I have no reason to, to, to doubt it. So if your if your calculations are correct, then answer me this, Doc. Where did all the money go? <laughs> what do you mean? Women, well, well, women, go own, women got education with this money and took over men by a wide margin, by the way. Women uh, entered the professions and took over professions by a wide margin in many professions and in the most well-paying profession. All and right, so how do you explain in black America... Because, again, black women make a lot of hay out of the idea that they, they're more educated than black men, make more than black men, all this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So how do they explain that black that the rank and file black woman has an average net worth of five dollars and carries the most school debt of anybody in the country? As a matter of fact, uh, this past midterm election season, uh, a black woman named Stacey Abrams was running for the governor of Atlanta. And yeah, she had over a quarter of a million dollars in debt. I know. How do you explain that? Black women and black men and the black community in general are the exception. Um, 
what I'm saying indeed applies mostly to white people. Okay. And to begins to apply more and more to Hispanics. The All blacks right. the blacks are outside the mainstream in many, many respects, and we can discuss why. I mean, I'd be delighted, but they are not a good example, shall we say. They're not a representative sample. Okay. But it's a fact. It's a fact that blacks are not the majority of the population in the United States. Oh, no doubt. And, no doubt about that. And that at least, I think I'm underestimating massively, but at least six trillion. At least. Change hands. Right. Yeah. Listen, but, but, you, even, but even if you take into account the racial piece, if we set aside black American, we just focus on, you know, whites, leave the Hispanics out, leave the Jews out. We just focus on Gentile white folks in America. Okay. How do you, if, if these these women are getting all this money and, and what, in matter of fact, you even used the term annuity with your interview with Granite. You mm -hmm. said in the economic world, when one party gives a payment uh, over time to True. another party, they call that an annuity. True. So a, di a dividend if, is an annuity. Yeah. True. Right. So if white women are receiving this massive wealth transfer from their husbands and so forth in the form of an annuity, what Tom like is called vagina money, the payment of use of a, of a past vagina. That's that's mm -hmm. what you're paying for. Okay. So if that's true. My question becomes, what are they doing with all the money? You say, well, they went to school, they got educated. Well, how do you explain this, the school debt bubble in the United States? Well, and 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 and, that, and the majority of that debt is being carried. Forget black women; now we're taking them out of the equation. The majority of the debt burden is being carried by white women. The 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 average age of the woman's marcher. Uh, we talked about the women's march earlier. The average age, because I looked it up on Survey Monkey. The average age of the woman's marcher is 49 years old, white, college educated. We know that women consume more in terms of health care, spending and all the rest of it. And these women's marchers were marching because they wanted to retain Obamacare. They wanted uh, uh, Planned Parenthood. In other words, they want me, the blue collar black man, skilled tradesman with no debt to pay for them to fucking suck. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. They want me to pay for them to fucking suck and, and have all these sexual adventures with these knuckleheads. And they want me to pay for it with my taxes. If, 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 if what you're saying is true, doctor, then how do you explain all this other phenomenon? I'm talking about white people now. White women. Pre pretty easily, actually. But we have to enter economics for that. But I will, I will give you the, the crux of it. The gist of it. First of all, I did not talk about transfer of money, cash. I talked about transfer of wealth, six trillion right. in terms of wealth. The vast All majority, right. vast majority of the savings of Americans are in real estate. All right. Uh, especially residential property and especially first homes. All so right. there has been a massive transfer of real estate, more technically speaking. Okay. And now real estate is not easily monetized, especially after 2008. In other words, you cannot convert it easily to money. So That's right. A lot of this money is in brick and mortar. That's the first thing. The second thing, the United States is among the few countries in the world where wages for the middle class have actually declined in real terms over the last 20 years. Okay. So this transfer of wealth has been actually diminishing. It's been diminishing because um, wages have stagnated in the United States. Middle okay. class compensation has been stagnated. The middle class is decimated completely. There are more poor people and the rich became a hell of a lot richer. So there is this problem. And the second and the third reason that you don't that you seem to you seem to observe a contradiction. There isn't contradiction. The facts are facts. But the third reason is that women tend have different priorities to men. Okay. We discovered in studies, and I just made a video about it on my YouTube channel, we discovered in studies that women dedicate a, a huge percentage of their resources and make purchasing decisions geared towards the welfare of their children. Okay. So the money is there. It's just allocated not on consumption and not on, definitely not on ostentatious or conspicuous consumption, but is allocated, is invested in the future of the children. So when we say women, the transfer of wealth has been to women and children, if you wish. And I have no problem with any of that. That's fine. That's fine. And the allocation between women and children is such 
that the bulk of the transferred wealth is actually invested in the children's future, well-being, medical care, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why okay. we don't see it. But the fact is that six tri- I mean, men have been impoverished by six bi- trillion, and women have been enriched by six billion a trillion. All right, but how do you explain these women's marchers? All of this stuff about see, look, now I know you're a scientist. I know you worked in the economic world at a high level and all that. So what I'm about to say is veering on the populist with political, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it anyway because I want to get your reaction. My position is this in black America, but we can apply this to whites as well. My position is this. Why should I have to pay for a woman who says black, white or otherwise, who's been who's been banging the drum for decades now, my body my choice, you as a man have no say over what I choose to do with my body. In other words, you have no say over who I choose to fuck and suck. That's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. So why do I have to pay for it? If it's your body and your choice, madam, you pay for it, not me. And that's what they're marching for with this woman's march and, 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 and all the rest of it. They want increased government spending, which means the taxpayer, me, to pay for their health care, for their for their abortions, and all the rest of it. Why can't they pay for it, especially if they're getting all these wealth transfers or asset transfers, et cetera, so forth? Then that's the disconnect to me. First of all, the facts are that men are becoming poorer much faster than women. That is why about one-third of all primary breadwinners in the United States are now women, ten right. times ten times higher than 20 years ago. Okay, that is happening because women are becoming richer faster than men, or if you want, men are becoming poorer faster than women. But how do we explain the women's marchers and them and them wanting increased spending on Obamacare? Age, average age is forty nine, white, college educated. How do we explain that? Well, why not? If you can obtain, if you can obtain rent, this is this behavior is called rent. There was a, a Nobel Prize winning economist Herbert Simon, and Herbert Simon says said. As long as there is the opportunity or prospect of obtaining unilateral transfers, not against economic performance or work, people will invest resources in obtaining it. And this is called rent behavior. So they are rent seekers. It's totally normal behavior. Wouldn't you march if you thought that you can end up with another $10,000 a year? Of course you would march. <laughs> so that's, so, that so, doesn't that surprise me. This point. That's just a straight greed. That doesn't surprise me. But... The thing is this, the feminism has been, um, and again, I, I think you may have noticed throughout our conversation that I'm doing my best not to be biased in the sense that I'm, cri- I'm an equal, e- equal opportunity critic. <laughs> Chris, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you've made it clear that you're a scientist. You, you know, deal with the facts. I don't care. I mean, I don't care. Right. I don't, I, you know, I don't care who wins and who loses. It's right. their problem. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an observer. Right. So what has happened is, we have modified the economic uh, sphere, the, the, the business sphere, the, the workplace space. Yeah. But we have not modified social institutions and attendant laws equally. Our laws and our social institutions still hark back to the agricultural industrial period. I agree. I agree. We haven't changed them. Yes. Well, 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 well but, but, but that's mainly because women don't want it to change, doctor. Your, your critique of the MGTOWs and, and red pillars and so, so forth, notwithstanding, I'm not saying that they are above reproach or they... Or they or no, they, I'm, not, they, I'm not criticizing them at all. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah, they're pathetic. Uh, right, <laughs> yeah. Your, 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 your observations are noted. Fair enough. But I argue that there's a there there, and we can start just with this mating piece. A lot of women... Even though, and I know you know the literature on this, a lot of women, even though they're high earning, high, they're able to support themselves, they don't want to date those guys that you mentioned have experienced a decline in wages. They mm-hmm. still expect to mate with a man that makes more than they do. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to change the dating norms. They want to keep the dating norms ossified in the amber of the 19th or the mid 20th century. But they still want to live a 21st century lifestyle as a liberated woman. That's bullshit. Excuse my expression. That's just no other way of saying it. That's crap. First of all, I, I never criticize anyone for uh, in the sense that I disagree with values. I'm just saying 
red pillars and so on are fighting a rear guard losing action losing it's the war is lost so they are pathetic in the sense that they are trying to reverse social trends and economic trends way way too late the place and the time for this kind of movements was the 1950s and 60s the war is lost completely because technology and um, other developments have rendered the workplace and have rendered the, the economy such that women's skills, talents, traits, qualities, and inherent inbuilt hardware and software right. are now much better suited for the future than men. Right. There's nothing we can do about it. It's like women would have organized a red pillar, red pill uh, movement at the beginning of a, a cultural revolution. There's nothing to do. When the agricultural revolution started, muscles reigned. Period. There's nothing you could do about it. Right. No, no amount of feminism at the beginning of agricultural revolution could have reversed the trend of male dominance. No amount of red pilling and MGTOWs and I don't know what else can reverse the coming female dominance. The world has changed. Mm -hmm. Women are not fair. Women are taking advantage of this exactly as men did at the beginning of the agricultural revolution. Um, and why not? Why wouldn't they do that? I mean, this is life. It's survival right. of the fittest. It's the women. Right. If they can get money from the government via rent-seeking and money from you via divorce, and on top of it obtain social and other benefits, and on top of it fuck around and get paid alimony, and on top of it travel to Greece and again fuck around, and get alimony and, and child support. And I don't know what else they can get. Um, all the power to them. I mean, sure, that's how society operates. Interest groups mm -hmm. clash and may the strongest and the fittest win. Not mm -hmm. the best, right. the strongest and the fittest. All right, so and, since you talked about the strongest and the fittest, let me push back to you on this. I'm a skilled tradesman. That was my, my, my life for uh, most of my adult working life, uh, 22 years on the job. No woman worked on my job. And when we tried, we my job bent over backwards to try to bring women in. It was a colossal failure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Women didn't want to do skilled trade, blue collar union man work. They don't want to do it. So if the future belongs to women, my question to you is simply this, doctor. Who, who's going to make the doo-doo go down the toilet? Women? Men. Men are going to be the low level, low skilled, uneducated, uh, muscle power where it's still needed. Increasingly, it will not be needed. 50, according to McKinsey, 53% of all blue-collar jobs will be replaced by automation um, by 2020. Uh, by 2030, I'm sorry. So, um, gradually, men will not be needed even in, in muscle-bound uh, uh, activities. So, men are being pushed into niches and the niche is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Reminds me of the 19th century joke, how do you capture an elephant? You divide right. Africa in two, and then you divide it in four, and then you divide it in 16, and then you <laughs> divide it in 1,960. And finally, the elephant has so little space that it has to stand on one leg, and then you <laughs> capture the elephant. So this is what's happening to men. They are being yeah. pushed to smaller and small, smaller plots and parches. Of, I mean, the territory is becoming smaller and smaller, more and more claustrophobic. Men are going to enter the claustrophobic age where there are no jobs and the few jobs there are suck and there are mech jobs, you know, uh, temporary jobs and stuff like that. And women are going to take over the high paying jobs, the white collar jobs, the, and they already are in some professions over, overwhelmingly, medicine, law. And uh, that's it. And that's reality because the world is about networking, about teamwork, about empathy, about collaboration, and women are far better at this than men. And the world is about education. And the shocking thing is that women are far better at this than men. Mm -hmm. Women are far better students than men. Far. You don't have to believe me. Go, go online. Check the data. No, no. I mean, it's been, I mean, it's been, a lot's been written about it. I'm not going to argue with you about that. It's too and much, so, too much it, evidence to the contrary. So, yeah. So, listen. Nothing to do about it, you know. This is life. Agricultural, yeah. industrial period of paradise. Heaven is finished. Now All right. Are, so, let me, so let me ask redundant. you this, doctor. Now we are redundant. All right. Well, well, let me ask you this, doctor. All right, fair enough. So 
how do you explain numerous university studies right here in, in my hometown of Philly? Uh, university of Pennsylvania has done this and others around the world. Not just female unhappiness in the United States, but worldwide. More women are recording being unhappier than ever, while men's happiness has gone up. How do you explain that? Well, I don't know. It's strange <laughs> because it's strange because most men report a marked decline in happiness, in happiness after divorce. Men want to remain married. Women initiate divorce. That's true. Of, That's true. Seventy-three percent of all divorces are initiated by women. So I, w I don't know why women would be. I think women should be a hell of a lot happier after they get rid of these redundant appendages known as men. And, <laughs> and men should be unhappy because they've lost the service providers known as women. However, well, I tell you, I'm, I'm, a com I'm a confirmed bachelor. I never married. By choice. I, I, had, I had opportunities to marry. I turned it down because the women weren't hot enough. So I said, hell with it. I'm not going to get married to a plain Jane with a heart of gold and be changed at the hip to somebody that does nothing for my dick. So I just chose to just go without it. So right. now I've had girlfriends and stuff since. But my point is, in black America, and I, and I know that what I'm about to say may be the exception to the rule, but I'm going to say it anyway. In black America, the divorce rate for first marriages is 74% versus 47% for white America. In black America, three out of every four black women never marry in their lifetime. The numbers are similar for black men. Forty of the, the, the largest cohort of confirmed bachelors in the United States today, over the age of 40, and that would be me, are, are black, black men. And right. that 40% of black, over 40, like 45% of black men today are single and childless. Let me tell you something, Doc, and I speak only for myself. I'm happy as a clam. I have right. no problems. I'm happy. Uh, I, I, the guys that I knew, now you were right. The guy, the black men I'm talking about that were married and got divorced, they're miserable, no doubt about it. To a man, they're miserable. But right. but the brothers like me that are confirmed bachelors like me, oh man, we're living the life of Riley. Yeah, and so I don't think, require I a woman to cook for me or clean for me or or be my mommy or anything like that. If she's here, it's because I enjoy her feminine and sexual companionship, and we enjoy our company. That's it. I think this is going to be the model of the future, where essentially singles will team up or hook up, if you wish, um, provide each other with uh, services like sex and, and so on, and then unhook um, and move on. I think, I think that's going to be the model of the future. I think marriage is dead. Um, wow. Marriage is dead essentially because it's not needed anymore. It's a very archaic and dysfunctional and inefficient mode of organizing production, child rearing, and distribution of wealth across generations and in the gener in, in intra -gen generations. So, marriage used to be a great, great way of distributing wealth across generations, which oh, was no its main, it. which was its main kind of role. I mean, marriage yeah. is not about love, not about anything. It was about producing children and passing on the, the cumulative wealth and property to them. That's that right. was what that was marriage was about. But today, there's no need for that. There are so many alternatives to producing children and so many alternatives to distributing or redistributing wealth ac across generations that, you know, this union is past the expiry date. So I think marriage is dying. And indeed, it's dying. I mean, look at the marriage rates in the United States. It's dying. So And it's, it'll be replaced by ad hoc arrangements. Now, no one can predict. I mean, there's polyamory, there's swinging lifestyle, there's, I mean... There are million open marriages, open relationships, non-open, yes, open. Everything. <laughs> I mean, men and women, men and women will negotiate ad hoc, short-term liaisons, hookups, and the, de the the terms and conditions will be defined very clearly. And also, it will be clear that. And I, I proposed a few a few years ago, twenty years ago almost. I proposed that the only way to revitalize marriage is to sign time-limited marriage contracts. Negotiable... Oh, that's an interesting concept. I want to hear about this one. Time-limited yeah. contracts. No. Like you, get married, you get married for two years and you renegotiate the contract every two years. And, then, I see. and if, if you don't reach an understanding or an ag agreement, the marriage expires automatically. No need to divorce. Gotcha. gotcha. So, no need to divorce. Like you sign a two-year contract or five-year contract if you want to have children, let's say. So minimum five-year contract if you want to have children. And then at the end of the five years, you don't need to go to court, divorce, divorce attorneys, and fucking mess, you know, 
this, you don't need any of this. The marriage expires on itself. That's it. And then if you if you do love your partner or like your partner or whatever, for whatever reason, or I don't know what, you want to maintain the family you need for the child, or I mean, whatever the reason may be, you renew the contract for another two years. Right. So it's time-limited marriages. And the only way, in my view, to revitalize marriage. And, now, uh, you know, I actually like that idea because as a union man, former union man, I know all about contracts and labor disputes and things yeah. of that nature. So that, that, that's appealing to me. The problem is... Uh, uh, well, there's two problems, uh, Dr. Vaknin. The first problem is the divorce industry here in the United States. A mm -hmm. big money in divorce courts and lawyers and all the rest of it. And that's one. But the other one, and again, I, my my, I may be the exception to the rule in terms of me being black and American, and whatnot. But a lot of black women don't want to negotiate. They want black men to do what they tell them, no questions asked. And uh, my position is you got to come to the table and negotiate. Black women don't want to. Matter of fact, I even have a term for them, uh, Dr. Vaknin. I refer to a lot of black women as sexual marketplace socialists. Well, um, first of all, the divorce industry is founded on the falsehoods of marriage. For example, marriage is presumed to be eternal because originally uh, the marriage, marriage format we are using today was created by the Catholic Church where divorce is forbidden. And right. the, belief, the belief was, in both the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, it's all a religious concept, that marriage was preordained by, by heaven and that your partner is your divinely, uh, divinely chosen, um, you know, intimate. Uh, but, so marriage was founded and is still founded on a series of misconceptions, lies, disinformation, and, and so on. And so to untangle it, you need the divorce industry. But if marriage were to be negotiated honestly, openly, as a, as you say, a labor contract, as a time-expired agreement on a long commercial basis and so on and so forth, I think the divorce industry will simply vanish. If there's no need for divorce, there will be no divorce industry. Women, of course, it's natural. I don't know why men are so angry. It's natural <laughs> for women. It's natural for women to blackmail, to threaten, to withhold, to extort. I mean, wouldn't you do the same? I mean, what's wrong with that? That's what every party does in every type of negotiation, geopolitical, political, commercial, and emotional. I mean, it's totally normal for them to do that. The onus, onus is on you not to allow them to do that. But why the emotions? Why get angry at them? I wouldn't, I mean, it's totally rational behavior. Grab as much as you can. In, in, a, in a, I mean, the art of the deal. Trump. Right. The Trump, yeah. Right. So. Uh, 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 all right. Well, let me ask you this, because we're coming down to the window, because you, you've been more, more than gracious. I really appreciate it. Let me ask you this. Uh, why do you think black Americans are so resistant to discussions on psych psychology and things of that nature? Why do you think that is? I think it's part of a larger disruption um, in black patterns of existence. Uh, first of all, I don't know if you've been to Africa. I lived four years in Africa. No, I haven't. Yeah, I, I've lived four years in Africa. What, what country? Yeah. I've lived in Nigeria and Sierra Leone and so on. So oh. I, I visited many of them. I visited Egypt, Morocco, but that's North Africa. That's more Arab. But I've, right. I've, been, to, I've been to the so-called black heart of Africa. Right, and I've I've worked in Sierra Leone and Nigeria, which are Western Africa. Right. So, um, and where most Black Americans are, emanate from that 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 area yeah, of Africa, not far, not far, not far from Dahomey and this, you know, the right. ports, the slave ports, right. and and so right. on. Yeah, and of course the uh, the version of slavery that is taught in the United States is heavily tainted, in my view at least, by the fact that. Precious few uh, scholars and so on bothered to actually visit the places and talk to the people and so on. I, I spent right. four years there. And slavery was one of my main uh, points of fascination. I, I inquired with people. There's still memories there. Still um, memory passed on from generation to generation. Institutional memory. Um, they really? Tell you yeah. Tell you stories. So, so, so I, got, I had to bring you back for another interview just to deal with that because that's oh, a yeah, fascinating yeah. piece. Yeah, I spoke to hundreds of people there. I interviewed effectively hundreds of people and so on. I mean, it was amazing. Four years. Anyhow, um, marriage patterns 
communal patterns, organizational social units in Africa today and in the United States are Western white imports which were imposed on blacks both in the mother continent and when they were transported. Mm -hmm. These are not indigenous natural outgrowths of self-organizing collectives. They were utterly imported and imposed, mainly at the beginning by missionaries, but later on by slave owners, plantation owners. I mean, so all these um, social units like family, community, I don't know what, state, I mean, all these things are alien, alien to blacks. It's, it doesn't make them inferior or superior. They simply organize themselves differently. The organizational unit in, in the overwhelming majority of Africa was the extended, extended family, and the extended family itself was clannish and was part of a tribe. Okay. And children, for example, were raised collectively. And, um, and um, monogamy was perceived as strange in many of these societies. And well, yeah, I mean, Africa yeah. today remains yeah. the most polygamous place on planet Earth. Yeah, I mean, um, and when you see that people live in monogamy because it's been outlawed by the colonial powers. You could go to jail if you, if you were a traditionalist, you know. And people, for example, the concept of court of law, totally alien to Africa. I mean, all legal proceedings took place within the tribe in a council of elders. And reconciliation, I mean, stunning. But in my view, the legal system, the indigenous legal system in Africa is far superior to anything the West came up with, you know. And yet they had to give it up. They had to give it up because the colonial powers instituted, you know, tribunals and so on, and you had to go there if you wanted to obtain justice, if you wanted... Well, you, the white man had the gun, so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's well, not only a question of gun, but, like, if you, got, if you got a verdict to enforce it, you needed to go through white channels. Right. White colonial channels. And uh, same in, in the plantations, and, uh, you know, if you... Because there have been rare cases where actually slaves sued their masters and i mean it's uh, pretty amazing but and so if you wanted to obtain just justice in any way shape or form formal or informal you had to appeal to the white i mean the white was the the ultimate uh, instance and authority and so a lot was imposed on on black uh, on blacks both in in africa itself and and when they were transported to the caribbean and to to the united states to to england by the way it was a massive trade Slave trade to England yeah. until it was outlawed in the middle of the nineteenth um, century. Right, world force played a big role in that. Yeah. So, um, and you discover, I discovered to my amazement, and of course, it's today's documented in texts and books and so on. I discovered that um, blacks. Doc, are you there? Dr. Vaknin, are you there? I see you still up on the screen, but uh, I don't know what happened. Ladies and gentlemen, we got, got some uh, sound difficulty here with uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Sam Vaknin. I want to see uh, if I can get him back on the line. Uh, Dr. Vaknin, are you there? Hello. And to oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah, you dropped out for some reason, uh, Dr. Vaknin, for about three or four minutes. Could you uh, start over and pick up where you left off? Uh, I'm not sure where I where I left off, but I'm saying yeah. that I'm saying that um, these institutions, for example, the nuclear family, were imposed on on blacks from the outside, and I think to this very day they have a conflicted relationship with these institutions. They are not. Uh, they are not an integral part of either the psychology or the sociology of, of uh, blacks, and they are not fully internalized, as we call it in psychology. They are not introjected. They are not an automatic knee-jerk response to the exigencies of life and society and reality, but they are like white men's reflexes implanted in black minds. And so... Um, Slavery 
the period of slavery exacerbated this dual dual relationship with, for example, the, the nuclear family. Yes. As a matter because, of fact, the, the, the famous scholar W.E.B. Du Bois famously talked about this in his immortal work, The Souls of Black Folk, the idea of a white mm -hmm. self and a black self, you know, the dual consciousness kind of fighting in the same body, right. that sort of thing. Right, yeah. in 1943, right. right. So the slavery, during slavery, I don't need to tell you, families were separated. Men were sold separately, women were sold separately, and children very often were sold separately. Right. So... Even if black had blacks decided to adopt the white man's way of organizing reality and society, they were not allowed to. They were not allowed to learn to read and write. They were not allowed to have nuclear functioning families because they were constantly separated, sold, resold, rebought. I mean, they were not allowed to develop their own effective communities. They were, I mean, there was constant interruption, constant intervention, constant malicious sometimes um, manipulation. And so not only did the blacks come from a background in Africa, which was antithetical, which was opposed to white values, white organizations, and white social units, but they were not allowed to internalize and assimilate white values, white organization principles, and white social units in their destination countries. When they tried to have a family, the family was torn apart. When they tried to organize as communities, they were they were executed when or or flogged. When they tried to learn to read and write, they were executed. So they were not given the chance to organically um, kind of assimilate in their environment. And we see these conflicts to this very day. They can't assimilate. The Jews have assimilated. The Jews came to the United States. They were they were an outlier minority, they were decried, they were derided, they were hated, anti-Semitism, this, that. But listen, a generation later, two generations later, the Jews assimilated. They became members of the elite, they became, you know, they, they moved on. They simply moved on, which is the reason, by the way, for the hatred between blacks and, and Jews. Blacks and Jews started from exactly the same point, right. hated, minor hated minorities. Right. Jews made, Leo Jews Frank, made, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but there was a famous or infamous case here in the United States in the I want to I want to say 30s or 40s. Uh, Leo yeah, the Frank lynching, the lynching, was the lynching was was, was lynched. Yeah, yeah. Lynch, yeah, the lynching of Leo Frank, of course, yes, and it was a Jew. Yeah. So they started from the same point, but the Jews made it, and the blacks failed. Right. And of course, the, the blacks resent it. They resent. I mean, like you were, you were like me. Why, why are you now? You, I, are you now going to help me? Like in the civil rights movement. Are you right. now going to help me? I mean, you were, like, you were like me. We, we came from the same, you know. Um, so the Jews started exactly like the, the blacks, but within right. a generation or two, they were way gone. And they became the right. landlords. They became the landlords of the blacks. They owned the grocery stores. I mean, they, they became, uh, the, the blacks became a, a minority among the Jews. It, it, it was inconceivable. It, was, it created a lot of hatred and a lot of resentment. Well, I mean, that's what the whole thing with the Women's March. Uh, uh, Tamika Mallory is the black woman founder of the Women's March. She attended a, a event by Nation of Islam leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan. The name of the event is called Savior's Day. She was there. He called her out by name, singled her out by name, and went into his... I, I, I would rightly call it anti-Semitic diatribe against Jewish folk. And that was the basis for calling the Women's March anti-Semitic. And then, you, you know, the rest of the story from there. So there's this relationship between black folks and Jews that you just mentioned, where there's a lot of enmity. And to be brutally frank, Dr. Rackman, you hit the nail on the head. I've long suspected that the real core, the real kernel or the real source of the butthurt on the part of a lot of blacks is that Jews succeeded and sure. blacks did for whatever reason they succeeded Envy. in black did. Envy. Envy is another diagnostic criteria of narcissism. Pathological envy is the ninth diagnostic criteria of narciss narcissistic personality disorder. If you go to Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, right. one, one of the diagnostic criteria of narcissistic personality disorder is pathologically envious of other people because of their accomplishments and perceives these accomplishments as unjust. 
Wow. It's exactly mm-hmm. the blacks, the black men's, the black, the blacks' attitude to the Jew. How come he made it and I didn't make it? There's something wrong here. There's some conspiracy. There's some maybe the Jew is colluding with other whites against me. So oh yeah, I, I just got finished doing an interview last night, Doctor Wagner, with a black woman, a good-looking, attractive, married, upper-middle class black woman living in 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 San Francisco. And she was talking about the Jewish conspiracy to control the media and all this. You know, they, they're trying to break up the black family. And I asked us, OK, where did you get all this information from? She couldn't give me a source, but she believed to the depths of her soul that the Jews were out to do black folk in. And I'm like, wait a minute, but you're you're doing well. You're successful. What Jew is holding you down? She oh, couldn't answer on. me. After nonsense. I mean, uh, <laughs> if anything, the Jews were very helpful, especially during the civil rights movement. I mean, they tried. Not all the Jews. Right. Not all the Jews. Right. Southern Jews were not. But Northern Jews were. So, but it's, it's, again, if you use narcissism, you suddenly understand everything. Because narcissists react with pathological envy when they start with the same position, at the same position as someone, and then that someone takes off and they remain stuck. That's, that's classic narcissistic reaction. Classic. And it's all mm. about envy. It's all about envy. I mean... Um, I've read all the texts. I read Baldwin and Dubois. I mean, I read I mean, it's, it's envy, simply envy. And um, there's a lot of bad blood because of this. Because of this envy, one. Um, but one why example. hate on the Jews for do, for being successful when blacks could just do the same thing? Uh, education. I mean, it's no secret to the Jews' success. Edu- a strong emphasis on education. Strong emphasis on marriage. Strong emphasis on the family. You just do yeah. those three things. In American society, you will succeed. Strong emphasis on savings, frugality. Savings is another one, yes. That's right. That's and right, that's frugality, saving, yes. These values are also common to Asians. And Asians are moving up the level. Asians that's are right. upwardly mobile. And, and blacks hate Jew, uh, 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 Asians too. There's a real oh, famous Korean. rap song. Korean. There's a famous rap song by Ice Cube called Black Korea, where he talks Korean. about this. And so, 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 what's the excuse there? So, so, I guess in another ten years, it'll be an Asian conspiracy uh, to control the media and hold black people down and all this nonsense. Well, you saw, you saw Spike Lee movies. I mean, yeah, it's it's out there, and I fully believe that. As as other minorities move up the social ladder, the the blacks, I mean, blacks have two choices. They can say, "Listen, some something's fucked up with us, with us. The the problem is with us. Let's." Let's introspect. Let's look at ourselves. Let's become self-aware. Let's see what we can fix. Let's, that's one thing, one way. And the other way is, say, is saying, listen, nothing's wrong with us. It's just a conspiracy against us by varying minorities, and especially if they are white-tinted. And that's a narcissistic reaction. This paranoia and this, uh, this is a narcissistic reaction. No one is saying, at least of all me, that blacks are not discriminated against, including institutionally, that they are not horribly mistreated and have been even more horribly mistreated, and that there's a legacy of, of suppression, uh, ruination, disruption, and imposition of, of um, social values and other values which are alien to, to the blacks. I mean, and no one is saying any of this. Of course, blacks have been, you know, horrible what happened to them. It's genocide. Blacks have been subjected to uh, slow motion genocide. And no one is saying no. But look, the Jews were subjected to fast move, fast forward. Of course, of course, it's documented. Well documented. And they have established the state of Israel, which is one of the richest in the world. I mean, that's right. That's right. There's there's a limit, a limit to victimhood. And the blacks discovered that victimhood is a profitable industry. And that's the thing. They got addicted to victimhood. They are, I mean, there are many drug addicts, but I think the number of victimhood addicts far outweighs the number of drug addicts. Because victimhood pays, simply pays. Whether you are. Whereas drug, uh, drug addicts don't. <laughs> you don't get paid right. to be a drug addict. Yeah. Right. So if, whether you are a black professor at a university, victimhood pays. Whether you are an activist in the Women's March, victimhood pays. Whether you are Louis Farrakhan with the Nation of Islam, victimhood pays. I mean, victimhood pays. It works. It's a working adaptation. Why give it up? And I got to tell you, uh, 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 Professor, now, 
like I said, I'm black. I, you know, parents, you know, solid working middle class. W went to work right out of high school. Worked for 22 years. I, 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 the reason why I got into this line of work is because my job came to an end due to a work injury. So I reinvented myself into a podcaster and talk show host. Been very successful at it. I'm living proof that if you, you know, it, it may sound corny, but it's true. I'm living proof that if you work hard, you have a plan, you work hard, you stick to the plan, you persevere through the rough patches, you will make it. You know what I get talk, called by other black people, Dr. Vagnon? You know what I get called? Uncle Tom, coon, sellout. You you lick the white man's ass crack clean. All this other nine, you're an agent. All this stuff. It's ridiculous. It is, and it's paranoid, technically. Clinically speaking, it's paranoid. It's a great pity that blacks did not use victimhood as a launching pad, as the Jews did. The Jews also embraced their victimhood, but as a launching pad. The, the blacks embraced their victimhood as the ultimate solution for all existential problems. So why go further? It works. It's okay. It's the path of least resistance. And that's it. And that's where they're stuck, in the loop. Again, no one is denying, least of all me, that blacks have been and are being victimized. I'm not denying this. I think what police departments around the country are doing is murder, simply. But I got to tell you, but I, I have to say with all due respect, Dr. Vack, and I know that you're not an American citizen and you haven't lived here as long as I have, but with all due respect, I have to say, as a black man who lived in, in inner city black America for most of my adult life, I got to tell you, or in my coming up years too, I got to tell you, if you are a black man and you have trouble with the police today, I'm not talking about back in the 60s and the turn of the century. I'm talking about today. If you have run-ins with the cops, it's almost always because you did something you weren't supposed to be doing. That's right. almost always the case. And we are not talking about the fact that the police reacts. We are talking about the proportion proportionality of the reaction. So the well, virulence... there's more black men that are acting, acting and cutting up and not and acting a fool. What's the cop supposed to do? Uh, turn a blind eye to that so these people can predate on other black people? Is that what we're supposed to do? No. Turn a blind eye no. to it? Not you, not no you. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about my fellow black yeah, Americans. Because yeah. no, this, no this is what they'll say. This is what they'll say. They'll say you're supposed to uh, uh, hold the police and the power structure accountable and not hold these knuckleheads who are predating on other black people accountable. We're supposed to turn a blind eye to their crap in the name of know. racism and all of that. It's, it's utter ridiculous. And Absolutely. that's the reason why I wanted to have you a conversation with <laughs> you not... because I had to find out what's the psychology behind that. Yeah, I was not saying this because obviously the greatest victims of blacks are blacks. That's right. But, uh, so that's all I'm saying. What I'm saying is that police could have been taught proportional de-escalation methods and so on, and they haven't been because it's not a priority. Because black lives don't matter so much. That's, that's a fact. I mean, there's prejudice, bias, racism. The black so. victims' lives don't matter. That's that's the problem. The black victims uh, who get well, predated on yes. by these people, of they course. don't matter. Blacks don't respect themselves. No, what, have I, what have I been saying throughout this interview? Black adopted, blacks adopted victimhood as the ultimate solution, existential solution. So, of course, when you're a victim, you can't respect yourself. And there is no self-respect. No self-respect of men, no self-respect uh, as men, no self-respect as blacks. No, I mean, and of course, no one respects someone who doesn't respect himself. It starts from the blacks, of course. It's something the whites learn from the blacks. If they don't respect themselves, why respect them? But what I'm trying to say is that blacks have been victimized, and I think they are still being victimized. That's not the issue at all. So do, so do women. Women are still being victimized in big parts of the world. Jews are being victimized. Including in your own city, I mean, uh, in Pittsburgh, so, I mean, right, everyone yeah, is yeah. everyone is victimized sometime or another. I mean, do you know any group on, in the universe who is not victimized at one time or another? Right. But you should never get stuck on your victimhood. Leverage it and make it a profession, a profitable profession, because you will end up paying the price. You will end up paying the price because victimhood is the mental equivalent of paralysis. Hmm. And, you, and you will end up stagnating and you will end up, you know, festering and you will end up, you know, where the blacks ended up. And, you know, I'm glad you say that. And I think this is a good end point. 
and uh, we could we have to to be continued. But just as an end point, last thing I want to ask you. I'm glad you mentioned the paralysis piece. I've always marveled how for all the academics that blacks have today, we have a lot of black academics mm -hmm. and all the rest of it and public and pundits and so forth. We never have black evolutionary psychologists, psychologists such as yourself, a varying stripe um, and thinkers like a Dr. Jordan Peterson. We never have people like that. All of the brain power is devoted to racism and, and in more particular are being victimized by it and that whites are responsible for it and that every problem that we have is reducible to that. So we never have discussions about yeah. malignant narcissism. Is, we never yeah. have discussions about what Dr. Jordan Peterson's talking about. We don't have a Dr. Jordan Peterson. And right. I think that's appalling in the 21st century. It's appalling, but utterly predictable. This is called confirmation bias. When you benefit from some position, ideology, idea, belief, or value, you tend to filter out information that countervails or contradicts it because you benefit and you want to continue to benefit. So you don't want to be contradicted or doubt. And so you filter out and you, on the contrary, filter in, you accept, you adopt your uh, information that supports your preconceived notions and biases and prejudices and so on. Now, the main industry of the black community is victimhood, the main industry. In a variety of ways, crime is a form of victimhood. The victims oh, yeah. of crime, victims of crime are of course victims. I mean, everything is about victimhood. And so, yeah, black I, I, let me just jump in here real quick, uh, uh, Dr. Vatnin, because I'm gonna tell you something. In my uh, position as a talk show host, one of the big debates over the past year, year and a half in black American circles on YouTube and Facebook and whatnot, where my show can be heard, is the idea between black men and black women that black women scorn the straight arrow guys like me and get, and suck and fuck the worst type of guys in black community, the gangbangers, ne'er-do-wells, and all the rest of it. And the argument goes that we are, guys like me, are supposed to be the cleanup man for all the fallout between these black women getting with these knuckleheads. And we got to go back and clean up the community. We got to go back and uplift the community. We got to be mentors to their kids and all this stuff. And I started to stir online in the past few years by, by de declaring that I refuse to be the cleanup man. And you should see the sheer reaction I get, not just from black women, which would be understandable, but a not insignificant number <laughs> of, of black men, too. True. True. They feel that I have a duty to serve the community, which really means being a cleanup man after these black women and the worst kind of black men that they want to suck and fuck. Yep. I think we could call it a day here and uh, reserve the right to continue this conversation. Hello, yes, uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wagner, for all the crap that we had to go through to get this together. I'm glad that it finally happened. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time. And we definitely, to be continued, I got to bring you back. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And have a nice day then. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Dr. Sam Vaknin, world expert on malignant narcissism. Get his book. You got to get his book. Malignant narcissism, uh, excuse me, malignant self love narcissism revisited. It's in its 10th edition. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's like the Bible of narcissism. If you want to understand what narcissism is, narcissistic personality disorder, all that stuff, you want to understand that how it manifests in its various ways in daily life and beyond, you got to get that book. I want to thank everybody for taking the time out to listen to this exclusive interview. Be prepared for more such exclusive interviews to come in 2019. With that, I'm going to say peace. We are gone.